I suck at jujitsu. How do I suck less? This is Josh McKinney, and I just want to welcome you to the newest episode of the I Suck a Jiu-Jitsu Show. So today, I have um, one of the funnier interviews I think I've ever put out on the show. Uh, we had uh, my good friend Josh Severett on, and Josh is a brown belt from the St. Louis area. He has been doing jiu-jitsu for like 17 years. He's been training longer than I have. I've known him for a very long time, and uh, I just enjoy every time he and I get to sit down and talk, uh, especially we get to train together, stuff like that. He, he comes and trains at a lot of the open mats at my gym, and so um, you know, I, I didn't really know what to expect on this episode. I kind of had anticipated we would do 45 minutes to an hour and um, really just talk about being a smaller guy and uh, being able to be on the mats for a long time as a smaller guy. And that is definitely something we get into. But Josh came in more prepared than uh, probably any guest that I've ever had on the show and definitely more prepared than I ever am before an episode of the show. And uh, just had a lot of good stories to bring up, uh, a lot of really, really funny stories. Like I said, I do think this is probably one of the funnier episodes that we've ever put out. Um, you're going to get to hear about um, why judo rules, you know, ruins Josh's life every time he hears it. You're going to hear about being the smallest person ever on the I Suck at Jiu-Jitsu show, which is wild. Apparently, we only have interview big guys on the I Suck at Jiu-Jitsu show. Um, and there's a lot of other really just fun things that he does on this episode. I also, um, just from where the episode starts out, if you can, I would check out at least the first five minutes of this interview on YouTube uh, because Josh has some visuals that he even brings on to the show. And, um, you know, we have a lot of fun with that. We just really get into some really good stories and have a really fun conversation. I think that this for a lot of people is exactly what they hope for when they listen to the I Suck at Jiu-Jitsu show. Um, you get a lot of humor, you get a, a lot of laughs, but you also do get a lot of good information and a lot of useful information. His perspective on what small guys should be focused on and what they should be doing to get better at Jiu-Jitsu, uh, I think is just absolutely gold. And uh, I will quit rambling and we will just go ahead and get into this episode. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoy this interview with Josh and Josh separate. Here it is. Freaking, That's how he hangs out, man. Freaking Bryce. He's um, the brains behind the operation. We all know that. I don't think that. Everyone true. that watches out there, you guys know. I don't think anybody <laughs> thinks that. All right. That a character. Let's get started. Fantastic. Well, I wanted to get started. Bryce and I talked about this. So for all those out there, I don't know if you guys know that Josh is actually a celebrity. Outside of what he does on this podcast, I was listening casually to the worlds this year, and lo and behold, I heard a familiar voice. So... One of the things I wanted to do before it gets popular is I had this photograph that I wanted you to sign for. Oh, wow. Yeah, and then I've got this cool frame, and we're just going to put this up the whole time, So too. with a pen. However you want to sign it. Okay. I just, or you can even you can say something fun, too, or you can just sign your name. But. I'll say, to my biggest fan... <laughs> Oh, yeah, I will. Absolutely. I will. Shut up, Bryce. Okay, beautiful. Fantastic. I just went Josh, but I feel like I signed my Josh pretty pretty different. Yeah. And so it I it kind of says to my biggest fan, Josh, who is you? I don't know if you guys can see that. But oh, yeah. it's yeah. also me too. That's yeah. um that's gonna be worth a lot of money one day, man. Oh, absolutely. Well, for those that don't know, I'm ahead of the curve. You yeah, know? that's so. that's gonna be a charity auction thing. Um, that you will definitely, I mean, or you don't donate it to charity. <laughs> you just, you just monetize This one's that. my personal collection. Yeah. Now I'm actually going to put this up on my desk at work right next to my wife. So my wife will be right here <laughs> and it's going to be Josh right next to that. And then people will be like, Hey, who's that? And you'll be like, Oh, you don't know Josh McKinney. And then they'll always go, no, 
No, I don't. I've I nev- have no idea. I've who never this guy heard is. of this guy. So hopefully this doesn't smear. If it does, I've got another one. You brought two. I brought two. Well, because oh. I, I mean, if I'm going to buy one, I might as well buy two, right? I and s- also, let's, let's zoom in. I mean, I spent seventy eight cents on that. So I mean, it's not like I was, you know, coming in here spending thousands. That was a good. That was a good prop. I think that's a good place for it. Oh no, I should have. Can you see that on the oh, camera? Yeah. That's perfect. Okay. Leave that there the whole time too. <laughs> That's a great. I'll tell you this. Shout out Summy Squeeze Photography. I mean, who, fantastic photo. Yeah, if you don't shout her out, she will fight you, <laughs> right? Bryce, have you ever posted something online and Summer like message you and be like, "You didn't tag me in it." Within a minute. Within a minute. Did you say Summer Kelly? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't yep. know she took photos. Fantastic. Yeah. You didn't know about Summy Squeeze Photography? Dude, did not know. Oh my gosh. I dude. mean, I knew It's cuz I don't tag her in anything. Oh, that probably <laughs> makes sense. That makes sense. Josh, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing well, man. How are you doing? I am good. I'm I'm ready to go. I always like to counter when somebody uses proper English and says they're doing well oh, yeah. with I am doing good. Um, <laughs> because I just want you to know what show you're on. You know? That's like, right. We don't. We don't. We're not doing well here. We're in Granite City, bro. Yeah. I try not to correct people, but it's that stuff. Like, I, like in my own head, I'm always a grammar Nazi. Are you it's, really? Oh, absolutely. So I do it with my, like, my wife will say things, and in my head, I'm like, I want to correct you, but I'm not <laughs> going to, because that's going to start a fight. What are the most common grammar mishaps that, that you hear? Um, it's more spelling. So I'll see it in emails with your and your, right? Oh, yeah. Those a lot of times. Um, that's one, one that I actually get right. But the speaking like, was and were, right? Like, I was doing this you know, instead of I were, you know, those kinds of things. Like, my mom's from more of a rural area, and so a lot of times that comes in. And so um, in the back of my mind, I'm like, I got to correct this. But then I know if I do that, it makes me look like an asshole. So I don't. And so you just never do it? That's right. Just let him, I let him continue to speak that way, even though it's improper. You let him continue to be a <laughs> moron is what you're no, saying. No, that's not true. That's not true. It's just their vernacular. That's how they speak, right? There is a, do you know who Gary Goldman is? Gary Goldman? Goldman, G-U-L-M-A-N? No. He's a, he's a comedian, but he has this really good bit about uh about quinoa and he's like and people will pronounce it quinoa well he said they'll pronounce it quinoa (laughs) and he's like and so you know and i might even go to a restaurant where you know like i'm in the south and i'll be like hey can i have some uh quinoa and they'll be like oh it's quinoa and he's like i know i was talking down to you (laughs) i assumed you didn't know i assumed since where we're at that you have no formal education at all (laughs) exactly so you have no idea how to pronounce this and within two minutes, we've already lost everyone who is uh, south of us. Well, Just, all the quinoa fans are really upset. <laughs> all the quinoa fans, <laughs> man. <laughs> So uh, I just wanted to kind of start with you. Well, I, I wanted to first see what was going to be on this photo. I know that you had brought in a oh, photo. Yeah, I didn't know where we were going to How did you go. know I brought it? Because you saw it when I came in earlier? I just saw that you had a frame. And I was like, uh, that would be weird to just, I wonder what he, I wonder if he just carries around, like he doesn't know he could put a photo in his wallet. And he just carries <laughs> around a photo Just randomly with carries frames? Yeah. No, actually, Bryce and I set this up. That's where I got the photo from. So kudos to Bryce. Man. Uh, yeah, because we talked about it after you were on The Worlds. Uh, I don't know if we had talked about doing the podcast then or not, but whenever he reached out, I was like, I have this idea. I was like, now since Josh was an announcer on The Worlds, he's clearly famous. That's, you know, And yeah. so eventually he's not going to be around anymore because he's going to move to L.A. He's going to be super wealthy, and he's going to be part of that big jiu-jitsu community. So mm. I was like, I got to get a photo now and get it signed, and then I'm going to retire on that when I sell it later. You know what they paid me for being a commentator on the world? Zero dollars, I assume. Act, act, absolutely nothing. <laughs> they know? pulled you right off the mat, too, didn't they? They literally, I got done competing, and I was scorched. And my buddy, Jake Watson, who often commentates, um, in the middle of my match, I look up, and Jake's in my corner. I'm like, oh, that's weird. And um, I end up losing. I'm laying down. And uh, he's like, dude, that was such a good match. And I just make the joke, hey, Jake, if you end up needing anyone to commentate with you, my schedule just opened up. <laughs> and he uh, he goes, could you be ready in four minutes? And I'm like, uh, I, I suppose I could. Like, I, I'm like, are you... Are you serious? He's like, no, I, I actually was about to have to go solo. Uh, Kendall is coaching her sister. He's like, it'll be five minutes tops. Um, she just has one. She'll just do her match, and then Kendall will be back. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So I take my gi top off, throw a shirt on, still have gi pants, still pouring sweat. They give me the headset. I'm sweating into poor Kendall Reusing's headset, and I uh, 
um, they give me that like, oh yeah, it'll be five minutes. Kendall comes back up within five minutes and she goes, hey, you guys are good, right? And Jake goes, oh yeah, we're good. And so for the next three and a half hours, I was commentating at Worlds. That's fantastic. And so, yeah, that was, um, I got some good feedback on it too. Oh, dude, it was great. It was super entertaining. But yeah. it was it was so weird because I, you know, was sitting in my chair, tuned in, you know, on my iPad or whatever, and I'm watching and I hear this voice and I'm like, this voice is so familiar. And then later on, I was like, oh, that's Josh. Like, why does he keep talking about chest over chest? Why is that all this guy keeps saying? Yeah. You know, like, why is he? He's talking about, he's trying to sell instructionals. This has got to be Josh right now. It's got to be Josh. Yeah. And that was, uh, you nailed it. It was me. It was you. And so, yeah, I had a bunch of texts or Facebook messages, and it would be like, I think I specifically have yours that's like, dude, is this you? <laughs> and then like 10 minutes later, oh my gosh, this is you. This is you. Like this is, then like 10 minutes later, how did this happen? Yeah. Why oh, yeah. did they let you do this? <laughs> what were they thinking? Yeah. And uh, I still haven't even like reached out to Flo since then and been like, hey, just so you guys know. I'm available. Yeah. I, I don't even, <laughs> you know, I just feel like if, if they wanted me, they would be like, oh yeah, they would have contacted you. Yeah. It's one of those situations that they didn't get back to you. So you're like, oh, that must have been terrible. Yeah. They just like <laughs> didn't message me. They didn't, uh, yeah, they didn't do it. So you actually, you've commentated before. I have. You've commentated, you know, the famous Josh McKinney's matches. I did. I, was that respect two or respect one? I can't remember. I was, I didn't compete on respect one. It had to be two. It was two. Yeah. And, uh, that was a fun story. Cause so Jay, JW, uh, writes my instructor, he came up to me one day and he was like, hey, do you want to commentate for respect to? And I was like, well, sure. Why wouldn't I want to do that? I'm like, with who? And he uh, he was like, oh, Kyle's going to be on there. I was like, Watson? I was like, oh, fantastic. So I was like, you know, this is going to be terrible. And he's like, well, it'll, it'll be something. Um, but it was fun. Uh, you know, it's weird, I think, going in real time when you're watching jujitsu, trying to explain, because you don't know who your audience is going to be. Is it going to mm -hmm. be people? You assume it's going to be jujitsu people because who else is watching jujitsu matches, like professional jujitsu matches? Grandmas, I, you know? I assume. Uh, I mean, I, the way I look at it, everybody out there, I mean, it's sports blowing up, right? It's going to be on ESPN probably next year. Yeah, just like Josh McKinney's famous, you know? Uh, <laughs> it's going to be on ESPN <laughs> next year. Uh, but yeah, it was fun. Um, but for those out there, if you guys haven't watched Josh's match, I think it was either before the match um, or it was earlier, like before we ever came out. He knew I was doing the commentating. He was like, hey, when my match is going, I want you to say I'm a galvanizing man as many times <laughs> as you can. As many times as you can. And so I was like, all right, that's what I'm going to do. And so if you watch the footage, I think I said it no less than like 10 times. And I didn't tell Kyle I was going to do this. And so he started like looking at me every time I would say galvanizing. He's like, why are you saying that? And I was like, oh, let's look at him. I mean, how galvanizing is that man? That was that was branding right there, that was, man. That was it. Yeah, that was I was doing kind of for context. I was kind of doing a um, a the rock jujitsu knockoff for a okay. lot of my brand. And so instead of the most electrifying man uh, in <laughs> sports entertainment, I was the most galvanizing man on Instagram. Nice. And uh, you know, you you played it well. I tried. You know? I remember the only thing I remember in the rewatch from that commentary is guy goes double unders, but like. Uh, butt grip on the double unders okay. on me. Yeah. And I remember like my butt is completely hanging out uh, in front of the entire Chase Park Plaza and you just like nonchalant, like, ooh, a little bit of a gi malfunction there. <laughs> <laughs> well, what else am I supposed to say? I'm going to be like, wow, that is a nice ass. That would have been a great thing to say. <laughs> you know, you'd be like, oh, we got the best seats in the house, man. <laughs> like, You know, it's one of those rules in IBJJF, or, and I assume it was IBJJF rule set for that, but that's always, I thought, one of the weirdest rules. It's like, hey, you can't put your fingers in the gi or the pants unless you're on the top of the pants where you're just trying to pull them down. Mm -hmm. Then you can go ham. Fingers all in all day, brother. And it's even more interesting, and people don't generally play this grip, but I've had it, like, I always seem to be the uki when I go to Kyle's. Anytime he's had seminars, I don't even remember who taught it, but somebody taught the grip in the front of the pants, and it was the most uncomfortable seminar for me, because literally... you going, like, full hand? Like, I mean, four fingers in, <laughs> you know? And so, literally, they are going into the front of my pants, and... Obviously, you know, you're going to address that in a real round. You're going to that's going to be the first grip no matter what that you're breaking. I yeah, and I think you're also just like what is am I being assaulted right now? Yeah, is this I is, don't know that I can send it to this. Is this real jujitsu or are they just <laughs> like finally my chance? You I, know? It's an odd. I mean, look, 
You know, sometimes you just got to shoot your shot, right? And maybe that's what they're doing. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think that there have probably been too many instructors that have done that, but <laughs> I think that that is too often um, the advice. But uh, so, um, kind of, do you remember that event? It, it, do you remember I do. that? I do, because um, Rafael Lovato was the main, I think he was the, uh, is that the main event? Is that what they call it? Or like yeah. the headliner? Who did he have in that? Was that Steve Patterson? That, that sounds had? right. Yeah. That sounds right. And I think it was in the Gi, because uh -huh. uh, I think all of Respect was in the Gi, right? Because uh -huh. I think that was kind of Jay's thing. He's like, we're going to do this old school. It's going to be, you know, all in the Gi. And I want to say that was like, what, 2016? Probably. 2016? That sounded, I so want to for Seven me, that ago? was my first match at Brown Belt. Um, okay. Actually, they they had offered me the match. It was against a really legitimate Brown Belt while I was still a Purple Belt, and I just assumed at that moment when Kyle had accepted it already, I'm like, I guess I'm getting promoted soon. Right. I guess I'm going to be promoted because they didn't have people competing at different belts. Like, I guess I'm going to get my Brown Belt soon. And then a, a few weeks before, I, I got promoted and had that match and... Uh, you and Kyle got a little tipsy and commentated oh, on we those sure did. matches. No, it was fun. Uh, you know, we actually, I went out to dinner uh, with Rafael Lovato with uh, little Brian. You know Brian Immels? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so he, I think, sent me a text and was like, hey, um, I'm, I have this dinner set up with Rafael. And he's like, it's like me right now. Do you want to go? And I was like, sure, of course. Why wouldn't I want to do that? But I think it's because he was like, you talk a lot. Yeah. So I feel, you know, <laughs> if I bring you in there, I won't be super awkward around Rafael. Mm -hmm. Super cool dude, by the way. You should probably try to get him on this podcast. I mean, you've had Kenny Florian, so I mean, That's, sky's the limit at this point. That is true. That you is know? true. I wonder. I bet that would be a really fun. Give me my topics. What would be my topics to talk Ooh, to him about? It's Raphael. First, everyone that calls him Rafael. Because he is American. Yeah. And so that R is, that's, a, that's, a, that's an R. That's a normal R. <laughs> it's not the H, you know, yeah. as they pronounce it in Portuguese. Um, you can start there. Um, I think also just how dominant. You could talk to, you know, him about, he was one of, I think, you know, when I, because I started a long time ago. When I started, he was one of, I think, one of the more dominant American black belts, and there were not many at that time uh, at all. So yeah. I think you could talk about that would be fun, uh, his MMA career, because he transitioned, obviously, from being very dominant in IBJJF to M MMA and how that went for him. And then kind of now, I think he's got twins. So you guys could share in, you know, how much he gets to train now that he's got kids, too. Man, you're hired. Set it up, man. Yeah, you're you're hired. I think that uh, you're gonna do all of my interview prep from now on. I could. That I was, do come prepared. That is the one thing I do. That as was, you can see. Yeah, that was exactly. That was that was right off the top of your head too. You had a you had a, a Lovato interview already planned Nailed out. Nailed it, I'm, man. I'm in. Right. Uh, so you mentioned you've been doing jujitsu for a long time. Long time, man. I uh, I always like when I get to ask this on the podcast, and I don't know. What was your start for jujitsu? Why did you start jujitsu? Kind of where at? Um, what what did that kind of look like? For Absolutely. You? So I've been training for all those out there since 2005, and I'm sure they're looking at the camera right now, asking how old I am. I'm actually almost 40. I'm 38. <sighs> so I was 20. Uh, and actually, it's a fun story. So um, when I was an undergrad, so this would have been 2003 to 2007. I think it was the summer of 2005. And I was working at the Madison County Courthouse. And I was actually filing the same kind of documents for the cases I work on now, which is full circle, kind of a weird thing. But there was this guy that worked in document storage. His name was Sean. Sean's probably not watching this podcast, although he should. But I was talking to him one day, and he's a super cool dude. We we're in, he likes anime. I like anime. And so we were just talking about random stuff. And he brought up, you know, training. And I was like, what kind of training? Like, what are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, I've been training this martial art Brazilian jiu jitsu. And this is 2005, because this would have been, yeah, summer of 2005. And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I actually thought he just made it up. Like, <laughs> Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I was like, I heard the term jiu-jitsu, but Brazilian? Like, And so he's like, no, he explained all about it. He trained with Vagi. So okay. he was like one of the old school Vagi guys. Like when Brazilian Mike was still like a blue and purple belt, he was training. Like old school, like late 90s. Because I think Rodrigo came over in the mid, mid to late 90s, I think. Um, so he was telling me all about it. And he's like, let me show you this video. And so I went and hung out after work with him one day, and he put on Choke, right, the, the Hickson documentary. And it's funny because when you think about introducing someone to jujitsu, I think Choke would probably not be the one that I would, because it's yeah. kind of like super high level, you mm -hmm. know, and also it's kind of the MMA aspect of it. 
but it was awesome. I remember he were watching it and I was just like, this is fascinating, you know, and then seeing the rest of the family, like Hoyler was there and some of the smaller guys when they were training and kind of showing what Hickson was doing. But from that point, I was like, that's super cool. And the idea of being a smaller person, because as I'm sure everyone can see, I'm, you know, massive, just yeah. absolute <laughs> jack. Uh, learning a martial art that a smaller person could use to, you know, defend themselves, but also, you know, just to have some knowledge and tools how to move their body, I thought was really cool. And so I was like, I got to train this. And this was during the summer, and so I knew I was going back up to school. And so we popped on the internet, you know, and at that time, internet is 05, so decent but not like it is today and i found a website that there was a guy that was teaching people at the university of illinois which is where i was going to school at the time and it was jack mcficker right uh -huh. and he had this super like old school page and on the page had a picture of him at the gracie like in rio like the old farmhouse or whatever and elio sitting down in his chair super old because he was always old right and jack's there as a brown belt and so i was reading up about it and i'm like oh there's a guy that does this in Champagne. Like, what are the odds, right? And so when I went back up to school, that's what I did. They had Quad Day. They had, um, you know, all the different, like, clubs you could sign up for. And Jack and Jeff Serafin were sitting at the little booth or whatever. And so I came up, and I was like, you know, and, and introduced myself. I was like, saw your website, you know, just heard about this this summer. I was like, I want to train. And uh, I don't want to say the rest is history, but that's kind of the rest is history. I started training there. Um, it was two days a week. Jack would drive from Terre Haute. Uh -huh. All the way over to Champagne. I think it was on Tuesdays and Saturdays, or was it Thursdays and Saturdays? I want to say it was two days a week. And then they also had the club uh, at U of I that Jeff Serafin ran and Mike Arif. You ever meet Mike? Uh -huh. Joker, yeah. as they call him. Uh, they ran this club. And so I tried to do that a little bit on Fridays as well, but the main training days were either Tuesday, Saturday, or Thursday, Saturday. In Champagne, was it a, was it at a, W was it at a fitness center? It was. Or something? So it was okay. at the basement of a yes, fitness center. Okay. And we had to roll out the mats. And actually, it wasn't roll them out at that time. We had the blue mats where they uh, Velcro in, uh -huh. if you remember those. Yeah. And so Jack would have them stacked up. And that was part of the class. At the very beginning, you got in there, you set up the mats. Now, he also had his JKD part of it, too, which was really cool. Uh -huh. I actually missed training JKD in stand-up. You know, I haven't really done any stand-up since I moved back to the area in 2010. Uh, but you do your stand up for like 30, 45 minutes and then we go into jujitsu. Uh, and it was crazy at the time, like uh, people on here probably know Kyle, Kyle's a purple belt, uh -huh. right? Jeff Serafin was a purple belt and Dan Hornbuckle, you know, who ended up having a lot of success in MMA, super cool dude. He had just started the same time I did and he was far better than me. I, I was, I'm not good now, but he was, <laughs> he was far better. I was garbage then because I had no training. I had never wrestled. I'd never done any of that. And so for me, it was completely new. Uh, but I'd done karate as a kid. Like uh, when we were living in Highland at one point, they had like their little rec center and I was doing karate like once a week or whatever. And I hated the sparring aspect, you know, because I, I was, I was like, I don't want to get hit in the face. Uh -huh. I'm too pretty. You know? <laughs> I know you know that. I do. I clearly, yeah. that's why uh, I do jujitsu. Yeah. But I was like, I don't want to get hit in the face. And so that was the other thing I think that was kind of neat about it was like you can go real hard when you're training and, I, you know, injuries aren't really a thing. Although I learned like a month into it, that's not a thing because then I broke my pinky. Oh. Uh, like literally, and it was one of those, they sent uh, an ambulance to the fitness studio <laughs> because Mike was in med school, Mike Arif, and it, it broke. Like this dude basically fell when I pulled him into guard and my pinky broke. I don't know if you can see it. It doesn't even grow right to this day, the nail there. Uh but it, the way it looked, I guess, Mike was like super like, oh, man, this doesn't look good at all. And I'm like, well, I don't want to hear that. First yeah. of all. And I've been training a month. I think I just gotten my first gi because, you know, and that was an old school Atama. Uh -huh. Remember the Atama oh, yeah. gis? Bryce, you got an Atama gi? He doesn't know what that yeah, is. Yeah, he, he started too late. We're too Dude, old. Dude, he started like five minutes ago. Trying. But it had the old uh, stitch down the back. So instead of having the whole back uh -huh. just flat, there was a stitch down the middle. So anytime you were playing guard, you could feel that stitch. Mm -hmm. But I had just gotten the gi, right? And so then this happened, and Mike was like, oh, man, they're going to have to cut this sleeve off. And I was, you know, I was a poor college kid. I was like, bro, I don't have money Please don't. to buy another one of these <laughs> geese. But, yeah, so I thought, you know, going into it, the injuries wouldn't be a thing. And then, uh, yeah, I get injured a month in. So full circle here. You probably don't realize this. But uh, so I actually ended up with four or five sections of those blue mats. And those actually... Um, on part of the the wall mats that we had in the blue room yeah. at, at the the first head not HQ, um, we used those mats, oh. and so we had uh, 
they, they we used them for a while in my garage when we were training in my garage for sure um i remember you know for for you and i we had known each other we can get to to where that you seem to remember our origin of knowing each other more than i do i, uh, I have a weird like uh, that's one thing my wife always says i have a really really good memory i think honestly that's probably what's helped me along like with what I do and everything is I have a weird kind of, I, it's a photographic memory for the most part, but I remember weird details of things too that other people completely forget about. I don't, I assume it's just cause I'm weird, <laughs> but it's like, you know, people remember like the main stuff and I'm like, yeah, well, what about this? And they were like, why would you remember that? And I'm like, I don't know. It's yeah. just how my brain works. It's, it's not normal. Well, I remember for you one time I'm at the grocery store in Granite and we ran into each other and I was like, Hey dude, you, you train it at who might have an hour away from here. Right. How, why, why are you here? And you're like, oh, I live in Granite. <laughs> and that was when we started to like hang out more and train more together. Yeah. So I was like, you know, I have a gym two minutes away from here, right? And you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, cool. I have no idea. It just goes to show like I, you know, live in my own little world. It's like, you know, I, I do, I'm very routine. I do the same stuff all the time. But yeah, it was good. Like, and for me at the time, you know, I just, I think at that time I was probably training five, six days a week. Cause I think that's when I was really heavily competing and I was, I was driving an hour each way. I was just putting a load of miles on my car, but you were like, yeah, I've got this gym, you know, like you should come train in open mats. And it was uh -huh. great. Yeah, man. It was that, great. That was, and you had no idea you were training on the mats that you started with. That's actually pretty cool. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> no, that is pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, it was different. And that was a time like, you know, in 2005 when I started a lot of jujitsu, I mean, you didn't have YouTube. I mean, I think YouTube may have been around, but in terms of the instructionals, they were not good, mm -hmm. you know? And so most of the stuff you got was either directly from your instructor or like you went to a tournament and saw something kind of unique and you were like, oh, I want to emulate that. I want to do that. Not realizing you had none of the details. So of course you're <laughs> going to do it poorly. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, Barambola, let me go see how I can do this. And then finally Hoffa shows an instructional and you're like, I'm an oh, idiot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That I shouldn't have tried to do that without actually knowing how to do it. Dude, what's interesting too, though, is I would argue that jujitsu YouTube now still sucks. Um, and, and the reason I would say that is like when I compare it, you know, like really what motivated me, we just kind of started to push our YouTube channel. Shout out Josh McKinney BJJ. Uh, but the what motivated me to do it was kind of looking at the broad spectrum of jujitsu YouTube and comparing it to like things like cooking. Things like knife collecting, things like there are just so many other topics when you really look at the the broad spectrum of YouTube and you go like, man, this is how big these channels are and this is how many channels there are that are that big. And then you look at jujitsu and you go, wow, there's not most of these channels. There, there are 10 pretty decent sized channels. The rest of this is junk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and oh. you you see it. It's just very interesting to me. Um, I think people think that they like missed the boat on jujitsu YouTube. Yeah. But I really don't think that that is. So the I case. should start a channel. Is what I you're think saying. you should absolutely <laughs> start a channel. No, I think it's like anything. I'm. Uh, I, I guess that's another thing. I guess to describe me is I'm a hobbyist. I have lots of hobbies, right? And so with various hobbies, you're absolutely right. And I think you, you know, knife collecting. Shout out uh, to. Justin Kitchell? Yeah, Justin, yep. <laughs> right? Which Justin and I have competed against each other, too. Uh -huh. You know, so that's a fun story. But yeah, um, it's funny. When you said Knife Collector, I knew exactly who you were talking about immediately. He, he, he actually has a YouTube channel. Does where, he really? Well, it's it's his bi the business that he uh, he works for. Yeah, yeah. He does Grand, their, their hashtag knife. Hashtag Grand Prairie Knives. Yep. He does their... Is that what it is? I think it's Grand Prairie. Isn't it Grand Prairie Knives, Brian? That sounds right. That sounds correct. I'm pretty I'm gonna, sure. I'm going to drink water on here. I figure yeah. that's fine. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, we can. Let's pretend that that's water in, in your flask just, that you yeah. just opened All up. Right. You know, you and Kyle Watson, man, can't can't keep you guys sober on this podcast. Hey, man. <laughs> yeah, that should tell you something about the podcast. Like, <laughs> hey, you want to come do my podcast? It's like, only if I can drink heavily. Oh, I, if I have to talk to you for any period of time, I've got to be drunk, Josh. Like, I get that. You know, I get that. So um, step back. How did we meet? Since you since you seem to know it, you had a so it's actually a fun story. I don't know if you know this. I don't. I, I think <laughs> we first met at a tournament in Terre Haute, Indiana, or Indianapolis, the Ego Tournament. Wasn't that one of like your first tournaments yeah. back in the day? Uh -huh. May, it might have been my second or third. Um, I stole white belt then. I want to say that was probably the first time I met you, because you were were you training with Kyle yet? Yeah, I, yeah, I had I, always trained with Kyle. Yeah, I thought so because. 
that was the second time I had been to an ego tournament. Before that was actually the ego tournament. I want to say this would have been 2007. So you must have went to the 2008. Yes. So that might have been the first time we met, which you would have been what, 13, 14, 13, 14 mm -hmm. super young. Um, but cool tournament. It was put on by Klingerman, you know, and it was kind of, uh, I don't know if it was the same year that they had it in like this soccer complex. Yeah where they had like the arcade going uh -huh. right next to the mats. And so you've got kids playing whatever games there are and all these lights going and you're trying to compete next to it. Uh, the year before that, so 07, we went and it was hilarious. So Kyle went up, I went up, a guy by the name of Fenil. I don't know if you ever met Fenil. I don't think so. Um, he was training up at U of I as well with us. Um, and we brought someone else, but I think Seraphin went too. Uh, but we all went up there because Kyle was actually a part of like the pro uh -huh. event that was the Nogi, right? And this was must have been 2007. And Kyle was like, well, you know, go ahead and just book a room, whatever, and we'll just all, like, crash together. And so he actually let me book the room, which was not very bright on his end, because in 2007, I mean, I'm a broke college kid, right? Uh -huh. And this is Indianapolis. I booked it at the Knights Inn, which I don't know if you guys have ever been to a Knights Inn. It's not nice. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the doors open into your room, so it's, you know, like a motel style. It's not even a hotel style, so mm -hmm. you know that's bad. Uh, but it was in like a really seedy area of town. I think literally the room was like $75 for a night. And we fit like six or seven oh, people yeah. in there. Uh, <laughs> and literally there was someone selling. I want to say it was probably crack. I don't know if it was crack because I didn't go inquire. I didn't go say, hey, what are you selling? But they were definitely selling drugs outside of the room the majority of the night. So super nice hotel. Uh, but yeah, um, that was a good tournament. And the next year we went back. And I'm pretty sure that was the first time I met you and you were a white belt at that time. That was like one of your first tournaments, right? Yeah, that, that sounds, I think it was my third tournament. I was start, trying to think like, okay, this dude remembers when we met. I don't even remember what competing at this. But yeah, it was, I think I did a, an OGC, an Ohio grappling challenge when that was still a thing. Oh, yeah. I did a Naga and then I did that Ego. Was that different than the Arnold Classic? The OGC? Yeah, so the OGC, I, I think it's still a tournament brand, but I believe it is the American Grappling Challenge yeah, now. Okay. Um, I think it was Dustin Ware that ran the tournament. Um, but yeah, those were my three. What was, was Kyle just like, yeah, this is this is my little child student? No, I don't, I don't even know if I remember. Kyle's always a character. Like, he's one of those guys at tournaments. I always talk to him, but he's always the best at just doing random things. Like, for instance... A vivid memory I have is being at an IBJJF tournament in Chicago. This is probably like 11 or 12. And I saw Kyle's like, hey, man, what's up? He's like, hey, what's up? Hey, can you, can hold, you it? hold this? Can yes, you hold this can for you me? Hold this it was an empty <laughs> bottle of water. And he walked away, and I was like, son of a bitch, man. Yeah. He's just really good at that. Um, yeah, but I don't, I, don't know if he, <laughs> I don't know if he introduced you as like, this is my child prodigy who's just going to be amazing at jiu-jitsu and revolutionize the world. I promise he was not introducing me to anybody like that at that time. <sighs> I don't he know, was man. like, hey, this is Josh. He's trying to lose weight doing <laughs> jiu-jitsu. You know? He's really terrible. <laughs> and that's probably a reflection on me as an instructor, but he's just that bad. Yep, that was that was pretty much, but maybe if I stick with it long enough, you know? Yeah. Um, that was, yeah, that was probably more of the introduction. But I think that was like the first time. And then obviously when I moved back to the area in 2010, I think the tournament scene, whether it was Naga or that in-house tournament we did, that's probably where I started to have more interaction like with you. And I knew you were training with Kyle because actually when I came back, that was kind of the big conundrum is where I'm going to train, mm -hmm. right? When I went down to law school in Carbondale, I was training with Andy Saban. Shout out, Andy. Fantastic guy. Mm -hmm. um, and we were doing like, he didn't have a full school then, right? So, because this is still, I was in law school 2007, 2010. And so he didn't have a full school. So or we would meet at the gymnasium in Carbondale at the in the wrestling mats right we trained there because his dad i think was the superintendent so he had some pull you know obviously he could just you know hey, hey i'm hey, just gonna like, go we're gonna use fight their... in the I'm just gonna, <laughs> in I'm just gymnasium gonna... <laughs> man <laughs> so we had that and then he got hooked up with a guy that had a karate school uh, but let him teach jiu-jitsu there for a while and so i think my third year of law school we had like more of a formalized gym but when I was coming back, it was kind of like a, where do I go train, right? Mm -hmm. And it's because I had started with Jack and started with Kyle because he was purple belt, you know, and trained there at U of I. And Kyle, that was before I think he did the Ultimate Fighter. Uh-huh. Uh, and then he came back to this area, moved to this area to do, um, I guess it was, it wasn't Head Nod Squad, it was... The hit uh, Squad. Hit Squad, mm -hmm. right? And he was their main instructor, I think, as a brown belt when he came down. I think he was, he was actually a purple belt when I so started. So he did come down as a purple uh -huh. Okay. And then he came down and was doing that. Um, and so whenever I was coming back to the area, 
Kyle's school was still relatively small. Mm -hmm. And so he didn't have a lot of, you know, people outside of white belt. He had a few blue belts. And at the time I was a blue belt and there was JW school, you know, he had a lot more senior people, like, cause he had been around a little longer and that's kind of how it always is. Right. And then you had Hot Eagle Vagi school too, but he was way far out. He was in like Fenton and I was like, I don't want to drive all the way out there. And so I remember it was a summer before I went to law school. I, um, you know, was coming back home because I'd started training in 05, right? And so when I came back the next summer, I was like, where am I going to train, right? And I talked to Jack, and I'm like, what schools are in the St. Louis area? And at that time, it was Hot Rigo and JW. That was mm -hmm. it, right? And so, you know, we talked a little bit, and I was like, well, you know, he's like, I've met JW. He's a really nice guy. And he didn't say anything bad about Hot Rigo. I mean, everyone knows everybody, but he's like, I think, you know, with my teaching style, you'd be better suited to, you know, check out Jay's and see what you like. And so I met Jay in 2006, I want to say, the summer of 2006. He was a purple belt, just got his brown belt, uh huh. right? And he was training out of a karate school, too, because that's kind of how it was back in the day. Like, no one really had, like, the fancy gym you have, right? Yeah. You know, it was, Nobody had mats, you know? Yeah, that's right. You know, like, you just, you trained wherever you could train, whether it was a garage or if it was a karate school, which it was for a lot, and... That's where I met Jay. Uh, Tyler Bishop at the time was a white belt. That's where I first met Tyler. His now wife, Jenna, wasn't even training yet. Um, so, yeah, came back and trained for a summer with Jay and, you know, really enjoyed it there. Like Jay, liked his instruction and then went back to school. And then that following summer before I went down to law school, I stayed up in Champaign. So I trained with Jack still before I went down to law school. And then that's when I started training with Andy down there and didn't train real hard, you know, maybe like one day a week. Um, but really didn't start training hard at all until I got back to the area mm -hmm. in 2010. That's when I really started taking jujitsu seriously. And so that is when the infamous judo rules tournament came oh, about. There it so, is, man. So let me let me hear your recollection. Hey guys, Josh McKinney here. Just wanted to interrupt this podcast and tell you about something that is really important we've been putting a lot of time into lately. Uh, for those of you who do not know, the Josh McKinney BJJ YouTube channel, we have been putting out two to three different videos each week, including doing video uploads of the podcast. Maybe you're watching this episode on YouTube. I think that this episode is definitely worth watching on YouTube because of... Uh, uh, just the different visuals and you know it really is one of the cleaner studios when it comes to uh, the jiu-jitsu content creation space and so uh, it really is a, a beautiful looking podcast if I do say so myself obviously I'm pretty biased uh, but all I wanted to do for today's commercial is not try to get you to buy anything um, not try to get you to sign up for anything but just wanted to, to let you know that we're putting out a lot of very useful content on the job Josh McKinney BJJ YouTube channel that if you like the I Suck at Jiu Jitsu show, I am sure that you are going to love because it is very clear, conceptual, very informational ways to learn Jiu Jitsu. And, and then, of course, always, there's always going to be humor. There's always going to be fun for anything that I like to do. And so uh, if you guys get the chance, be sure to check out the Josh McKinney BJJ YouTube channel. Uh, let's go ahead and get back to this episode. of because I, I competed at the same the same tournament yep like you said it was in a krav maga was it was it extreme krav maga? it was extreme okay. krav maga so is it extreme krav maga i know for me the main memory i have of that tournament is that's the first time my now wife but then girlfriend uh ever watched me compete did you win I did. Oh, I did. That's what drew her in. It did. She was like, well, I mean, if I this dude can pull guard like this <laughs> and keep guys <laughs> locked up and closed for so long, like, that's impressive. Right. Actually, that was, I want to say that that was, I don't think they had the name yet, but that was like the precursor to the Cozen tournaments. That was. Um, that the Vince and Jay ran, yeah. And so when they were doing that, the old, I, I had a match that actually changed the rule set. Um, the rule set was you will, um, if it's tie score, there's no advantages. If it's a tie score, you will compete in one minute overtimes, repeatedly starting from the feet until somebody scores or there is a submission. And I had 16 overtimes. <laughs> and they were like, there was this point where they were getting, like people were looking around like, maybe we should change the like rule this set matches went at on this for event. 45 minutes. It was... Uh, you know, and 
I'm not going to point any fingers. I'm pretty sure I could be wrong. I could, I don't want to, I don't want to give this guy a negative shout out, but I'm pretty sure Stubner was my rep. And I'm also pretty sure that I was up two zero, and I pulled guard and he gave the guy two points. And I Ooh. thought it was a pretty clear guard pull. So we shouldn't have done those 16 overtimes. Right. Um, but I, I eventually won the match, but you've uh, never anyway. given up. Uh, you know how much you are upset about the match no, and the fact I'm that furious. Stubner screwed you over. I'm furious. I think it was. I, I don't even want to say for sure. I might have. It might have not been. It might have been some <laughs> random. Dude. No, he's gonna watch this and yeah. he's gonna be like, I I didn't realize you had beef with me. Still, he's gonna be like, Josh, I didn't even ref at that time. That wasn't me. I wasn't even there. He's like, I have no idea what you're yeah. talking about. <laughs> so, uh, that was no. That was a fun tournament. Uh, that was I think 2011. I want to say that sounds right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so you were a blue belt. Mm -hmm. I was a blue belt. Um, so it came back, I think the first tournament I did when I came back to the area, cause I, I had done a couple tournaments actually before coming back to the area. My first like big tournament actually, um, man, was that my first tournament overall? It was my first tournament overall. So that's actually fun to talk about. Do you know what my first tournament ever in jujitsu was? No. The pans. Oh, 2007. that's a good first. That's a good start. It's, it's, it's highly stupid for a lot of reasons <laughs> because like it's here I am. I'd been training maybe like eight months. And, you know, they had talked about all these big tournaments. No, maybe it wasn't eight months. Had I been training? No, it would have been two years because it was 2007. I apparently can't do math. <laughs> I'm a lawyer. Um, but, no, it's 2007, so I've been training two years. Uh, but I hadn't, I think, competed yet in, like, a Naga or anything else, I, I don't think. Maybe I have. Maybe I have this memory wrong, but I feel like the Pans was, like, one of my very first tournaments. But I went out there to California in 2007. Uh, I was white belt. And I remember my game plan at the time was, like, hey, I, you know, I have really frustrating guard, like open guard. I'm just going to frustrate him. Right? Oh, yeah. And then somehow I'm going to make him mad. And how, <laughs> somehow I'm going to wind up on top or somehow I'm going to submit him. And then looking back, I'm like, that was highly, highly stupid. Yeah. Like yeah. that, not have a game plan going in. Um, but I think that was like one of my first big tournaments. Got triangled first match, naturally, you know, fly all the way out there. Didn't didn't get your guard pull out. Uh, I did. No, 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 no. I, uh, I don't even remember like the details other than getting triangled which is fantastic. Uh, but then when I moved back to the area um, in 2010 is when I started really taking competition seriously. And the first tournament I had when I was back was a Naga tournament locally, which those are always fun oh, for yeah. a host of reasons. Um, but then we had this in-house tournament. And I'm sure in that Naga tournament, you come in as a 140-pound white belt. I was probably or, smaller. Yeah, yeah, or blue belt. And you, they're like, hey, um, we don't have anybody your size, so you have to fight this 250-pound brown belt. Uh, <laughs> here, Go ahead. Good luck. Yeah, what's the rule set? Oh, there, there are, are no, aren't rules. There are no rules. If you want a heel hook in the gi, you can. Yeah. He's like, Here's oh, a he sword. Could. You know, there are no rules. That's, how, that's what you want. That's what was so great about the Nagas. <laughs> I think what drew me in was not the idea of like, oh, this is a cool tournament so I can get some experience. It was, I want to win a katana mm -hmm. because like, how cool is that? I mean, clearly you win a katana and put it up in your house and it says Naga on it. Everyone's going to know that like you're some famous jujitsu athlete. And you're just like, I'll never have to worry about cutting a watermelon again. I've got a katana. You, know, you got a katana. I, I was, I literally last podcast I recorded me and uh, my black belt, Robert talked about, I I was 14 and I won my division and they're like gave you a katana. Here's, here's a sword, bro. That's so like, wildly <laughs> irresponsible that's... too. Like, let's think of the worst thing we can hand a 14 year old. Hey, you want this katana? Uh huh. The only thing that would have been better is if they were like, Hey, here's a gun. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> that would have been probably the most American thing they would have done. That would have been sweet. Like, don't worry, we. We put the ammo in a Ziploc bag, and so yeah. You know, there's a please don't don't we'll keep load it your separate. gun. We'll keep it separate. Yeah, like <laughs> it's totally fine. You know, yeah. <laughs> we'll give them this gun. Uh, no, but then that tournament I think was twenty. I want to say twenty eleven uh, in house tournament, and I was a blue belt at the time, and it was a lot. I'd say at that time, I think Jay's idea was he wanted to do an in house tournament where he was going to bring in all the schools because I think in twenty eleven St Louis Jiu Jitsu had. You know, Kyle was teaching his school now, so he had that going. Rodrigo still had his school. I don't know if St. Charles MMA had his school at that point in time. They probably did. I would think they did. Yeah, I would think they did because um, Mike, was it Mike? What's Mike's last name? Rogers. Rogers, uh -huh. Mike Rogers. He, you know, because he's old from old school from Hoggies or Hoggies, <laughs> Rodrigo Hoggies uh, as well. And so I don't know if he had his school yet, but Jay's idea was I'm going to bring in everybody from St. Louis, right? Mm -hmm. And so we we're like, oh, that's great. Well, so similar to kind of Naga at the time, like they didn't have a lot of small guys, right? <laughs> and so here I am as a blue belt. I was probably 140 because I was competing in the light feather, 141. 
And so all Jay had at the time, I think, that were around my weight were like a couple white belts. And I think there might have been one blue belt, right? And so naturally, I get this match with this kid. And I think I want to say at this time, so if it's 2011, I was probably like 25 or 26. I was probably 26, right? Looking like I was 13. Of course. Of course. I just naturally look young. <laughs> and this, this kid might have been like 13. I don't think he was that young. I think he was like maybe 15 or 16, but he was young. And he had this gi on, and it said judo rules. <laughs> I think it was on the back, right? And so immediately, I'm like, what a dork, like, what a dorky thing to bring. But then also, as this match is getting ready to start, my thought is, like, I can't lose to this guy. No. Because here I am, you know, a jiu-jitsu guy. You are representing jiu-jitsu. At that, oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, this guy's got this judo rules gi on. I've, you know, I'm like, I, I, can't, I can't lose to this kid. So what happened? I lost, naturally. Mm-hmm. And it was in the last, like, 10 seconds of the match. I think I got my guard passed. <sighs> it was just the worst. Because I just got tired, right? Mm-hmm. I got tired. But here's what's a full circle great story about that guy. And I hope he's watching. And I mean, no disrespect <laughs> to him at all, right? So I remembered that match. And I remember coming up and talking to you. And you're just like, oh, man, you had a great match. And I was like, bro, I lost to a dude whose gi says judo rules. Like, I feel like an absolute failure right now. Mm-hmm. You know, but you talked me up. You know, he's Josh is a motivational speaker. Very positive guy. You know, he's like, oh, you'll you'll win the next one. Me you and know? Kyle talk bad about you after. But of yeah. course, I'm sure yeah. that everyone was like, like, remember how you? Severett represented jujitsu and he failed all of us? Oh, yeah. Jay was probably over there, too. Like, I got to I think I'm going to take his blue belt. <laughs> like, I I haven't demoted anybody, but I think on the spot, like, I got to demote this kid, you know? <laughs> so no joke. We talked earlier about you hosting those open mats mm-hmm. in Granite City. That kid came back because he trained with you for a for bit. A bit. Yep. He did. He came back for an open mat, and I was a purple belt at this time. So I think I got my purple belt, I want to say, man, was it 2014, 2013, 2014? And I'd been competing a lot. So this is when I was really, like, training super hard. I was training five, six days a week, doing your open mat. And he came in. I don't think he was quite a blue belt yet, and I think he had maybe been, like, 20 years old at this point uh-huh. in time, right? And we did the open mat, and I knew who he was. I don't think he remembered who I was. <laughs> and I proceeded to take that kid to school because in my mind, I was like, I have to redeem myself, right? And so that's exactly what I did. I think I tried submitting him as much as I could in the shortest period of time. And that is, without a doubt, to me, one of the most important things in jujitsu is that they say it's like, it's not about who's best, it's about who's left, right? I think that's a Chris Howder post. And the thing is... I have axes that I've been grinding for years, and I'm just praying that these guys that beat me at white and blue belt and were slightly disrespectful, they come back to jujitsu one day and they walk into my gym on a free trial. Oh, absolutely. Because I, you know, it's like this is finally, oh. this is finally ch- the chance to get. It's even. like that meme of the guy over by the tree. You're just like, yep, <laughs> and you're just waiting for. It. You know what's yours is funny. You said disrespectful. This kid never disrespected me. In fact, of all things, I'm probably the disrespectful <laughs> one because I, in my mind, was like. This kid. But, you know, at the time, too, I'd been training a lot and competing a lot. So, like, and for anyone that's trained with me, I'm not like, you know, the type that's going to like smash your face in. I try to really roll with a lot of finesse. And so, you know, I think when he came in, it was like, I'm going to beat you with jujitsu because you had that judo rule key on. And I've never forgotten that. <laughs> and here is my opportunity now to really showcase my jujitsu. And so I, I only hope that after that, he remembered me too. And he was like, man, that he must have really been bad at me this whole time. Either that or he was just like, man, that purple belt was a bully. Like, he was just, <laughs> I don't know what I ever did. I don't know what I did to this kid because I don't think he came back for a while. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I don't think so, which I, you know. I don't know if that was me or not. I have, I won't name them, um, but there was one time when I was a white belt. Kyle, one of Kyle's buddies came in, and he was, and I'm a 14-year-old chubby white belt, and this dude was starching me, right? Okay. And it was it was very, even looking back, I'm like, he was going unnecessarily hard, and he was just, he was kind of being a jerk. And it was like years and years later, I was a purple belt, and I was starting to get really good. And I, he might have been a brown belt or a black belt at the time, but I got the chance to roll with him again. And he didn't remember it all. He of didn't. Course not. He introduced himself to me. And, You're like, oh, I've met you. And I, I was know like, who you are. no, I was just like, oh yeah, it's it's nice to meet you, man. And I proceeded uh, to beat him is as bad as I've beaten anybody on the mat. It to a point where, like, at the end, Kyle was like, hey. Do you, do you not like that guy? <laughs> and I was like, I told Kyle the story and Kyle was dying. I Kyle, bet he loved it. Kyle's like, oh, that's awesome. He's but like, Secretly, good. Kyle actually remembered that. 
Oh, and yeah. he knew he's like, I'm setting this this guy oh, up. He yeah. was like, Oh yeah, you should come back and train. Hey, Josh McKinney, you know, he's real smooth. You want to roll with this guy, you know. He's he'll he'll take it easy on you. And then you proceeded just to beat the brakes off this guy. Oh yeah. Did yeah. he ever come back? Um, not to not to Kyle. Yeah. <laughs> not to I'm he probably still trains. Who knows? Um what an ambassador for the sport you are. Like, yeah. oh, I'm just gonna beat this guy up. There was you know. another time while we're talking about these stories. One time, this was this one I probably should feel bad about. I still don't. Um, but I, you know, this one was wrong. Uh, there was one time one of Kyle's guys. I might have been a brown belt at the time. Um, I submitted him with something right, and I want to say it was like a cross collar choke. And he is he's a white belt. Okay, okay. and he proceeded. I might have been a purple belt at the lowest, but I. Th- I, let's say I was approvable, but anyway, I cross collar choke him. He taps like any normal person would, and then he proceeds to tell me how I could have done the cross collar choke better. Oh, and then, like, I while it. I am still staring at him, like, "Are you serious right now?" The buzzer goes off, and I don't get to roll with this guy again oh. for like months and months. And I'm just like, again, I'm grinding this. You're a purple axe, belt, right? you said? Yeah, and oh, it's like it. this at the time that I'm probably. I don't think I have my school yet. But I definitely am not able to make it to Kyle's. This is when we're training in our garage a lot more. And I'm just like, man, as soon as I get the chance, as soon as I get the chance, and finally one day it, 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 I get that opportunity. And I cross-collar choke this guy a hundred times. Now, was it with the detail he gave you? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was it's like, yeah, you not. really helped me out there. In, in no. his mind, he's like, man, I taught Josh This so guy, is, like, he probably tells everyone to this day, he was like, you see that cross-collar choke? I taught him that. Yep. And then I, I never used the cross-collar choke again. Yo, know, he, he honestly, I'm pretty sure he re- knew because I could tell that he was like, this is this is no fun. This yeah. is not what I well, wanted. Well, that's like where you're really enjoying it. Yep. You know, and it makes you think like, am I a psychopath? To like want to do that, but no, I think it's like you're just trying to prove a point mm-hmm. at that point in time. If not to him, just to yourself, you know, because you're just like, oh, you didn't realize that what you did was such a big faux pas mm-hmm. that I'm gonna show you why. And I think like what's funny in jujitsu is like I think they have like the, everyone's got a post about it where there's the different like types of people at every gym, and you absolutely have the warrior that's going to teach you how to finish the submission when they got caught in it. Oh yeah, and he sounds like one of those guys. And the buzzer went off, which is unfortunate. But you got to love those people that like, you know, they want to teach you how to finish the submission as you caught them. It's like, bro, I caught you. I don't need you to walk me through the steps of how to finish the submission. Yeah, you wouldn't have tapped if I didn't know how to finish the submission. Right. I had uh, another, while we're just talking about abusing people, this one was, this was more recent. I was beating up one of our white belts really bad because he was running his mouth. Uh, But he was like wanting to get beat up, you know? But there is this level of you just don't know how bad you can get beat up until it happens. Oh, yeah. And you need to, especially if you're a loudmouth, you need to know. Oh. And so, um, you know, I, I the joke that I kept making, but this is 100% true how it was. I was like, I, I was beating him so bad that it was like funny. And then it stopped being funny. Oh, no. And then I kept doing it of until course. it got funny again. Oh, Like, that fantastic. was how bad it was. Was It was just like, it was definitely... So you went through kind of the roller coaster there, right? You start off, it's hilarious. You get down into the despair where it's like, this is not funny. It's actually <laughs> kind of depressing. And then you took it right back up again. It became funny. Mm-hmm. It's like the family guy thing, right? Sometimes family guy will have a joke and it's like, oh, that was funny. And then they'll just repeat it. And so you're like, okay... This is this is getting too much. Peter keeps doing that. Oh, with when his he falls in his knee, I and love it. And then they just like keep it going until you're starting to go like, <laughs> like oh man, they're really. But they're that's really... what makes Family Guy great. I love humor <laughs> like that. It's so absurd, right? It really is. And I think that's probably why you and I get along. We like absurd humor. I yeah, I agree. I think that like that was the only thing I was worried about with the podcast. Is like, man, I wonder if there's just going to be humor that we have to stay away from because a lot of times, you know. Our humor gets a little oh a dark little, or weird. Yeah, a little a little dark. I think dark is a good word. Well, yeah, for it was it. one of the things Josh asked me before we got on. He's like, "Is there anything we can talk about?" And I was like, "Absolutely not." Like, I part of me, and I think you're probably in the same boat. Have you ever thought about doing stand up comedy? I until I started to watch more comedians and hear about the prep, and you know, like oh, they're serious. Oh yeah, and it's hard. Yeah, like stand up comedy is hard, and I've always like one. I'm not that funny. Right. At least I don't think I am. Uh, but I've always kind of had an appreciation for it and would love to do it. 
I just like, I've talked to my wife about it. I'm like, the problem is for all stand up comedians, you have to be extremely personal. Like, you're going to talk about stuff that probably your close friends and family don't want you to talk about, mm-hmm. but that's the material, right? Yeah. Like, that's what comics do. But I think it's the self deprecation of it, right? Like, they understand that there's humor in making fun of yourself. So, like, when you ask me, is there anything we can't talk about? I'm like, absolutely not. I don't care. We could talk about how I got beaten by a kid with the judo rules game because uh, to this day I clearly have never forgotten it. Oh yeah, I, I I can't do the podcast without talking about the the times that I've lost. You oh, know, yeah, and there's Which, a lot of them. Well, for you, not as many as me because I'm probably the worst competitor. I would I would bet you know maybe not percentage wise, but I would bet I've lost more than you have. Ooh, probably because you've competed more than I have. Yeah. So uh, I think just uh-huh. by sheer numbers, you're probably right, but. I'd say if you, well, I don't know. We'd have to actually crunch the numbers. I, I definitely am probably one of the worst competitors out there. <laughs> and so that's what I always tell people. It's, I think, the more mental thing for me. Uh, but obviously, the more I competed, the better I got. And I think that's for anyone. Like, I always tell people, like, you can't just, like, pick and choose tournaments and think you're going to do well. You really have to compete as much as you can because developing how to compete well is its own skill outside of actually learning jujitsu. Mm-hmm. You know, because there's there's things that like you can win matches with that may not even be that technical, but it'll win you the match. Mm-hmm. Right. And no one remembers that that's how you won the match. It, it's the old Hoyler thing. You know, no one remembers how you won a world championship. It's just how you won the world champ- or you just won a world championship. Right. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't matter if you stalled and then you came up in 50 50 for your two points. Every Brazilian will be celebrating that forever, man. Mm-hmm. They don't care if they get a submission or not. They just want to win. And that is, man, that's for a lot of people, even for me, like coming up understanding that it's not like, oh, well, this guy beat this guy, so he's better at jiu-jitsu than him. It's like, yeah. a better day. Yeah. Or just maybe was smarter with his strategy in, in that moment. And his jiu-jitsu just fits that rule set better sometimes, you know? It's just like, what criteria do we measure with what somebody's jiu-jitsu is? And that's kind of the beauty of, like, having to feel it, is when you feel somebody who has just better jiu-jitsu than you, even if you could have beaten them by an advantage in the tournament, you can roll and go, oh, this guy is, he's just good. It actually probably makes you feel good too when you beat those guys because you come out like, oh, that guy was way better than me, but he <laughs> lost. I beat him. Uh huh. So good for me. Yep. Sucks that's, for him. That's the, uh, that is the thing of like realizing, especially in competition, that it's a game, you know? Oh, it's completely a game. But I think that's what's fun about it, right? And it keeps you honest. I mean, that's one of those, every tournament I've ever came home from, there's always things that I've focused on where I'm like, clearly, right? Because I never forgot the kid beating me with judo rules. I don't know how many times it's going to come up. That's what this podcast is going to be. The title just is just going to be judo, judo rules. rules. And it's going to, I've never trained judo. Uh, but I always, I came back with something to work on. Like something either I just did really poorly or something where I'm, you know, someone did something to me different that I'd not seen in the gym before. And I'm like, oh, I really have to focus on that. Mm-hmm. Which that was, I think for me, it wasn't, I think competition for me, it's not so much winning the competition that I always enjoyed. It was all the prep that went into it because Mm -hmm. I'd always trained so hard. And man, at that time too, when we were competing all the time and like Tyler and Jenna and all the, you know, Moose and all these guys were at the gym, we had a lot of really good competitors. And so what we would do to push ourselves to go out to the tournaments was actually what I enjoyed, which I, is that make me a masochist probably, Mm -hmm. but I think you have to have some sort of masochism to really do jujitsu all the time, right? Or want to continue it throughout your life. Because at some point in time, you're going to have a bum shoulder or a bum knee and you're going to keep training. I, man, I, I totally agree with that. That that has always been the fun part for me is the, is the prep for the tournament, right? Which is a, a weird thing, especially because very few sports are like that at all. Um, but just especially with jujitsu where you are, training when you're tired and you are getting beat up way more you you generally to set yourself up for success in a tournament you generally have to lose more you know be, be in worse you know lose more positional spars you know train with tougher people yep. and um yeah that was something that always was so fun for me too uh do you think do you think you're going to compete again uh, yeah. Uh, so that's actually the fun story. I think it's probably the reason I'm not a black belt too. Although I don't, you know, it's one of those, I always tell people, you know, you get it when you get it. Like, I think I've, that's the other reason I say I'm, you know, the worst competitor. I'm also the worst brown belt in St. Louis. <laughs> I think I've been a brown belt for six years now. Um, but do you I think, think it could just be that you're not likable? Uh, probably. I mean, that's part of it, you know, which I think that's what my wife was so shocked about whenever I said, Hey, I'm going to go do a podcast. She's like, who would want to interview you? <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, she never said that. She's actually super sweet. Um, but no, I I think that's part of the reason that Jay hasn't probably given me it because he knows I want to. Because I've competed at every belt level, right? Uh -huh. White, blue, purple, um, but I haven't competed at brown. Um, and I got my brown in 2016, and that was actually right before I switched job. Actually, I may have switched jobs right then and there where I went to the firm I'm at now, where I really started traveling heavily. Um, but that's where I stopped, I think, competing as regularly was when I got my brown. So, no, I got my brown in 2017. So 2016, I was still purple. I'd switched jobs, and then I got my brown the following year. And so I haven't competed, you know? And so... For me, I think I, it'd be good to do it. Yeah. And honestly, I want to get back into competing just from the idea of like making myself better because that's what got me better was always focusing on tournaments and really trying to perfect the things I do well, uh, the, the middle amount of things that I do well, yeah. uh, and you know, just getting ready for tournaments. So I, yeah, I think the short answer is I want to. Uh, the longer answer is can I make it happen yeah. with you know all the responsibilities I have at work and everything else I do. I don't know. Can you? I, I think so. I think it's priorities, right? Like you just have to make priorities to do that. So it's clear that I haven't made that a priority. But I think for 2024, you know, Jay told me this was probably a month ago. He's like, take a look at the schedule, see what tournaments are out there, and then just sign up for them. And honestly, yeah. sign up for a bunch of them. And if you only make one of them, it's great. And I think it's good advice because the other thing is I have to, I think if I want to do like pans or something, I think I have to qualify now, right? No, not, no, not only at Black Bowl. Oh, Bowl. perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cause clearly I'm not going to qualify. So I'm like, I could do as many <laughs> tournaments as I want. I'm never going to go to the pans. So I think right now the loose goal would be pans, which okay. I know it seems like a crazy goal for March and it's in Florida now, right? Or did they move it back to Irvine? Yep. Bryce says it's in Orlando. Oh, Orlando, which that's a cool area, man. I do like Cali better though. I think... I mean, Florida's cool, and that's not a knock for any Florida listeners out there. I like Florida. We already bashed the South to start. We, so. Well, that's right. I mean, the, and Florida is the South. Like, a lot of people, I think, forget that, like, Florida is the most Hoosier state in all of the U.S. <laughs> well, when you travel there, you only travel to the vacation spots. Yeah, like Orlando or uh -huh. Miami or Tampa. When you have taken the drive through florida like i have the multiple panhandle times <laughs> and uh you know what whether staying with my family in destin and then driving to pans um for you know like which is in orlando or uh, the time i got stranded in vegas and had to fly home to st louis and then drive the whole way to orlando to make pans oh, wow. um florida's rough man it's <laughs> it's a different vibe like you wouldn't think of what you're driving through until you drive through it and you're absolutely right because most of Florida outside of those vacation destinations is like middle of nowhere, Alabama. Yeah. And, you know, for all the Alabama fans out there, I'm sorry, but it's true. Uh, you know, if you get in the rural area in the south, it's kind of like a different country completely. Mm -hmm. You're driving by some shanties. You're driving by because there's just probably not a lot of money in the area because, you know, I outside of farming or who knows, you know, what the socioeconomic status is, but in a lot of rural America, it's not very high. Yeah. And so, yeah, you start seeing some kind of rough areas. And so you're driving through, you're like, this is not probably that safe. I probably <laughs> should get back on the main road. Yep. Let's keep driving. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree. So we will uh, put you down for pans. Right, yeah, yeah, just go ahead and put me down. So how about that? No, but that I think I do want to compete again. Just, you know, I would like to do that just to, you know, test myself again, you know, get out there. And I think it, it'll make me better too. probably get me over the hump I need to get over to kind of get to that next level. Is there any other motivation to doing it for you? Any other thing that you look at and you go, you know, this is why I would want to compete or this is, you know, is it, I guess, even at this point, is there, is there something missing for you where you go, man, I, you know, I really, it'd be cool to win like a big tournament. Like I, the best I've ever done is I got second at pants mm -hmm. as a purple, which was cool. It was master one. So it wasn't, it wasn't adult world, <laughs> which is not really the same. Right. Uh, but you know, that was, that was cool. Um, I've never actually won a big tournament. Mm -hmm. I think for all the tournaments I've won, they've been smaller ones. Um, so it'd be cool to win a big tournament, but I think more than anything, it's just to test yourself. So for me personally, I like the idea of pushing myself to see what I can do, right. To see if I can test myself to, you know, put myself in an uncomfortable situation and then, you know, prep for it as much as I can and see how I do. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it would be cool to win one, but that's what everyone says. Right. Yeah. They want the accolade to like actually win a big tournament. Um, but if I didn't ever win one, I don't care. I mean, Philippe Costa, I think always talked about, he never won a world championship until he became a black belt, mm -hmm. which I always thought was super cool. 
Um, because it's just how jujitsu is, man. I mean, some days you're you're on, some days you're off. But then he won a world championship. Then he won a world championship. You know? Yeah, you know who else has never won a world championship? It, it's Josh I, McKinney. Uh, not yet. Yeah, exactly. Again, that's why I have your sign. Because once you start winning all these world championships and become the best American mm-hmm. jiu-jitsu practitioner that's ever lived, this is going to be worth a lot of money. This is going to be a great podcast when that happens. Right. So this is going to be definitely one that we refer back to. Like, oh man, Josh Severett called it. That was ahead know? of it. Called my shot, man. I like that. That's pretty good. Hey guys, Josh McKinney here. Just wanted to interrupt this episode really quick and tell you about something we have going on at simplifyingjujitsu.com. Right now, efficient BJJ strength in 15 minutes is for sale at simplifyingjujitsu.com. This is an instructional by Steve McKinney. That's my dad. He is a black belt. He is a 62-year-old black belt and has been training jujitsu for a little longer than I have, about 16 years. And uh, for him, being able to stay on the mat being able to have longevity he really attributes a lot of it to not only his healthy lifestyle not only how he eats but how he lifts weight and so if that is something that interests you maybe you are a smaller guy wanting to put on some muscle maybe you are an older guy wanting to just be able to stay on the mat stay healthy and feel a little better and you don't have a lot of time to dedicate to strength training this is the absolute perfect instructional for you this instructional we take our 15 minute hit workouts and these are full body workouts and we teach you how to do them not just give you some workouts and say go try this but explain how you should be focused on reps how you should be thinking about reps and how you should be thinking about your growth and so uh, with that being said this is only available at simplifyingjujitsu.com and you only have to dedicate 15 to 30 minutes a week to get great results from the strength and conditioning program. And so again, only available at simplifyingjujitsu.com. Let's go ahead and get back to the episode. So on the podcast note, this is not the first podcast you've been on. It's not. It's not. What was your intro in the podcast? So, uh, I don't know for those out there that ever listened to the Bishop BJJ podcast, but that was the first one. And this was, man, that was probably 2014. I think that Tyler decided to host that. Um, so, you never had, have you had Tyler and Jenna on this podcast? Yet? I've had Jenna on. You had Jenna? Uh huh. Because she's obviously more important than Tyler. <laughs> well, I, just at the time, she was just, uh, she wasn't an MMA fighter. She was still doing jujitsu. And just killing and I think everyone. I, I want to say I messaged them both, and it was just like, Jenna had time. <laughs> I want to say that was what the, That's it was a, true. It was a really early podcast. Uh, okay. It was probably like in the 20s or 30s when Very I had cool. them on. Definitely, next time they come in, definitely a group that I should. Oh, yeah, you should. I should I think they're, and I think to this day, they still have a podcast, don't they? I know they had one they were doing during COVID. I know they did. I don't know if they still do. I think it's because, like you said, Tyler is just always involved in a million things. That guy has, like, so many irons always in so many fires. But at the time, you know, we had our group of people, like, because that was when we had Tyler was there, Jenna was there, Phil... Um, who's now black belt? Um, all these people are black belts, obviously, other than me, because I've just been <laughs> I've been here forever, right? But you know, life always throws wrenches. But um, I think John Perrine was uh-huh. on the podcast. Um, trying to figure out who else. I think it, at the time was Tyler, Jenna, John, Mike Collins. Mike Collins was on too. He's now uh, we oh, call yeah. him Cardio, okay. uh-huh. right? Which is always a fun name. Uh, he's black belt too. And Phil and I. And I remember Tyler one day was like, "Hey, man, like." would you guys be interested in doing a podcast? And I was like, you know, at the, and this was like probably 2014. And I was like, podcast, I was like, what are we going to talk about? And he's like, we'll just talk about jujitsu. There's not really a lot of jujitsu podcasts. He's like, we'll just come on and talk about jujitsu. Cause we were all heavily competing at the time. So we were following a lot of things. And that was, I think Tyler was really, you know, and this is going to be a huge shout out to him, but I think he was really forward thinking on a lot of things for jujitsu at the time, because mm-hmm. he was one of the first persons i know of that put out any kind of science or like analytics with jujitsu mm-hmm. right i think it was was it jujitsu science or what did he call it? it it was originally bishop bjj and then i think it will be turned into yeah BJJ. but i think you're right it was uh-huh. just bishop bjj.com but he ran like so what he would do is he'd go and watch the big tournaments pans worlds and then he would watch every match he'd calculate how many submissions versus how many matches there were mm-hmm. 
what type of submission, and then he would go back and run the analytics. And it was actually kind of cool because he started seeing a trend that like the first to score usually wins. Mm -hmm. Like I think it was like something like 70 or 75 percent. And so we would take that back to the gym and try to focus more on like what wins matches. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, collar chokes, you know, from the back win majority of the time, or rear naked choke wins majority of the time. And you can start to like, let's work on that, right? And so he was ahead of that. And then on the podcast thing too, I think that was kind of a cool thing. But it was always fun because I always felt like we'd do the podcast and I would come prepared. Like Tyler and I would talk ahead of time. And he's like, hey, I've got some ideas of what the podcast, you know, should be like this week. And I was like, oh, okay. And then me being this, you know, anal ultra, I'm going to prepare for stuff thing because that's just who I am. It was like, oh, I'll print out a bunch of stuff and bring it with me. And I think every time I showed up, Tyler was like, you literally brought like a binder of stuff. <laughs> like, why did you bring all this stuff? And I'm like, I want to like not sound like an idiot if I'm talking about things, mm -hmm. right? So, man, that is, yeah, you you really look at it that the blog that was you know Bishop BJJ and then the uh, uh, and then the podcast that was definitely forward thinking. You know what's even crazy uh, is I I was trying to think of who it was, but um, I recently had somebody on the show that was not a local person. And they referenced that study, one of the big studies that Bishop BJJ did nine years ago. And he's like, I can't remember. I think it was, I think it was Bishop BJJ that did it. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's yeah, yeah, you know, that 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 was that study. Yeah. And so even to this day, you are starting to get some people um, that are doing a little more trends and, and stuff, but it's still, to me, a very underutilized oh, yeah. thing. I would say, really, the only person that I know is really doing it. Do you ever see Less and Press More Involved on YouTube? Mm -mm. Uh, he's been on the podcast before. His name's Jake Luigi. He has a really, uh, really good YouTube channel, and they have a database that they're making now. It's called the Outlier Database. Oh, cool. And it is, it is trends. It's like, hey, here are these things actually happening in competition. Here's where they happen in competition. Here's, I think, how even how often they're happening that, in competition. That's brilliant. I think, especially for any sport, like, I think the reason, I've always been a huge baseball fan, love baseball, but I think it's the analytics mm -hmm. behind baseball that I love so much because you can, now it's different, right? With baseball, there's so many things that they can study, and they also have, like, 162-game season, mm -hmm. so they can really get into numbers, right? Whereas with jujitsu, if you don't compete all the time yourself, it's going to be hard to kind of run your own analytics, you know, or at least have any that are meaningful. Mm -hmm. I mean, that if you compete, you know, two times a year, it's hard to say, you know, this is what makes you successful in competition or not. But I think you're absolutely right. I think that probably is a huge under underutilized area is to actually run the analytics. You see it. Like if you watch enough jujitsu competitions, you will see what dominates. Mm -hmm. Like clearly right now in Nogi, the leg lock game is really dominant and it's you know, I think the old Danaher approach of you're ignoring half of the body. And there's a lot of, I think it's far better now than it was, say, even five years ago. But you see a lot of that that dominates. But then you also see a lot of just rear naked chokes, you know, good mount positioning, things like that that do well. Um, but I think, yeah, I, if any analytic people out there that, you know, are thinking about doing it, I'd highly recommend it. And I think you could probably make a very successful podcast or channel running all those numbers. And I'm sure Flo would probably appreciate it, too. But I'll tell you this, they wouldn't have you back on the world no, championships they commentary. Wouldn't, yeah. Well, you haven't got your call yet. No. But I think it's just because they're trying to find the right one to bring you back. You know, I think that they're worried about the money issue. They're like, it's just Josh is probably, he probably commands so much money yeah. that, you know, um, it definitely wasn't that they were getting hate mail the whole time. <laughs> it was just like, dude, I'm... Uh, uh, He's too expensive. I'm commentating on those on these matches, and I'm like, I don't know anybody's name. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, well, not everyone has their name on the back, although that's a new thing now, which is nice. It is you're like, oh, now I know who that is. Well, even then, I'm like, I can't pronounce that. Yeah, that's like, also I'm hard. definitely saying this wrong. And I'm like, okay, uh, Joao. Um, Mio. Yeah, they, and they, they all, you know, De Silva, Batista. Uh, you can De throw Jesus, out a, you, you can know? throw out a name. Yeah, like and you'll probably you'll probably get something close. <laughs> well, and so then I'm just like, I guess I'll just explain the jujitsu that I see. I guess I'll just talk about what these guys should be doing right now. Or this what, is what I'd be doing. Yeah. And clearly you knew more than them, even though you had lost. Even that's though why I you just were lost. <laughs> I thought that like something that would be interesting, and this is just, I'm making this up as I go along because I have no preparation. Not only that, I've never commentated on anything before. 
And you do I, a podcast though, so I mean you're you're prepared to talk. But about I don't. Things. I mean I don't break down jujitsu stuff. And, and at that time I hadn't. And it was just this these moments of like, okay, what would I want to hear right now? I've never even thought about this. And so I was like, I'm gonna really highlight who's winning because I think most of the time people don't in watching jujitsu when it's when we're breaking down the small grip fights and we're breaking down the small parts of distance i think that even a lot of black belts don't know until there's points scored until there's an advantage scored until something's scored they don't recognize that like oh this guy's ahead right now this guy is winning this inside fight this guy is winning the distance he's way too close on top he's going to pass eventually and when you start when i started to highlight that i was like okay here's something and then uh, when i finally started to get a groove i think i I think that kicked me off. Yeah, I mean, well, also, I'm sure Jake realized that, you know, you were going to take his job. That was That's probably, probably the it. biggest reason why you haven't been called back is Jake realizes that, you know, if you bring him back, I, what am I going to do? I don't know. Jake said he loved me on. He's like, man, it's nice having somebody that talks as much as you. <laughs> He's like, it was giving my voice a little bit of a break. It was really nice. Yeah, that was coming on to this podcast. I was like, well, the one thing we're not going to have a problem with is talking about stuff. Yeah, we're going to. But always- two things I want to talk about with what you said. One is the money. I think part of why it took so long for me to get on here is there was no money involved. And when Bryce told me, you know, he's like, hey, you know, we finally have a bunch of money. We can bring you on, exactly. you know, what's your rate per hour? And I told him and we made a deal and it was good. So I hope that's coming out of Bryce's paycheck, which is also negative money, uh, uh, oh. which is also, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I think the amount of money that I've lost on this podcast is pretty. You can take some of the debt. Yeah. If you want, if that's what you're looking for. Uh, sure. Yeah. You can have you want to buy into the show. Absolutely, <laughs> man. I'll invest. Uh, but the other thing I was going to say is um, I think what's unique um about jujitsu in general is like you said, some black belts may not recognize if they're winning the grip fight. I think it's because jujitsu as a whole to, to be good and excel, I think at the highest level, there's different kinds of, I think thought processes, personality, et cetera, that do well. You're going to have people that naturally just move. Well, they're not Mm going to be able to explain to you why they move the way that they move or why they're as good as they are. And so they may not recognize or be able to explain to you why they're ahead and what they're winning. But then you have other people, I think, that are more cerebral with jujitsu and they're kind of like in the moment focused on entirely, you know, like, oh, I've got this grip. So I know if I make this grip, I'm ahead, even if he doesn't recognize it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think everyone, you know, is different with how they approach it. I like it a lot of times because jujitsu for me kind of shuts off my brain. My brain is constantly going, Mm -hmm. just constant, which. I don't know if you've heard about this, but there's like a segment of the population and it's actually like a decent segment that has no internal like dialogue or monologue. That's the most bizarre thing in the world to me. I, like when I saw something about that, I was like, wait a minute, you're telling me there's people out there that literally have like no internal dialogue going on. And like that blew my mind. Cause I'm like, uh, like they're, constantly just random thoughts going through my head and it's the weirdest stuff i have 10 people in there bro yeah you know yeah i have a lot of there's a lot of different personalities talking up there absolutely that explains a lot (laughs) it tracks it should it should (laughs) that tracks so i guess okay here's on the statistics side of things because there's definitely something i wanted to touch on that we haven't gotten to yet i hit you with this statistic right before we started i believe you are the lightest person to ever be on the I Suck at Jiu-Jitsu show. Um, definitely the lightest man, but I want to say, <laughs> does do, do you outweigh Jenna? Uh, at this point, probably. Okay. And I think okay. it's because Jenna is in way better shape, yeah. and she was always in way better shape. Uh, I mean, dude, she is an athlete. Like, for those that don't know, she is an athlete. Actually, it's hilarious. I didn't bring a copy, but we could probably bring it up or have someone – put it in later on in the editing but there's a picture from the st louis post dispatch so like when she won the world as a brown belt uh-huh. which was a big deal that was such a cool tournament too when we were all there there's a bunch of photos we have at the gym and like one of them has me like five feet above everybody because they snapped the photo like right as i jumped that's awesome. you know and it's hilarious because tyler was like you look like you're like 10 feet tall and i was like clearly i'm not yeah uh but she was always like i want to say she probably and this is she's gonna be like uh, she, I think she wants to walk her, she probably walks around in the one thirties, I want to say, but like, she's in very good shape, mm-hmm. very athletic. Um, so I was always a little bigger than her in terms of weight, but not by much, but I mean, she would beat the shit out of me all the time. Like she was probably the best training partner I had from like blue through brown belt. Mm-hmm. 
And I think for her, it was kind of reciprocal because like she just beat the shit out of me at the time. <laughs> and that's how she got really good. And so I actually, Tyler doesn't know this, but I think she's successful today because of me. I think that that sounds right. You know, you got to get your rep somewhere. I hope know? she watches this too. And she's going to be like, yeah, you know, I beat you up so much. Um, that's how I got good. Actually, I still have tendonitis in my right arm from all of the arm bars <laughs> that she did to me. Uh, but there, going back to the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, there was an article once she won the Worlds, and they came and they took photos um, you know, of training because they were going to write a little piece about her. And they took a photo of her collar choking me from the back. Uh -huh. right? And I have like this weirdest face on it. I'm like giving this kind of thumbs up. And they used that as their photo for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, which is... Just very demoralizing for a host of reasons. But what's hilarious is anyone that's seen that photo, they're like, oh, that, that girl's beating you up. I'm like, that girl would crush like 99% oh. of people, by oh, the yeah. way. <laughs> She's very, very good at jujitsu and very athletic. But it almost looks like they photoshopped my face onto the picture. I'll send it to you after okay. this so that we can like crop it in and like show it to everyone. But here's a funny story. So this was probably, I want to say like 2015. And I had worked for a firm um, between my second and third year of law school. And they actually offered me a job, but I didn't go work for them because I got this other job offer that I thought was a little better. But I was still like friends with one of the main partners there. And I'd see her every now and then at the courthouse, you know, and we'd talk and different things like that. Well, she must have saw the St. Louis Post-Dispatch article. I kid you not, I get a letter one day at the office because we still got letters. And most stuff's email now, but you still get physical letters. And it was from it was from Beth. And so I opened it up and I'm like, why is she sending? We don't have any cases together. Like, why is she sending me? And I opened it up and all that was in it was a cutout That's of Jenna amazing. choking me from the St. Louis Post Dispatch. And it had no other context. And I opened it up, I was like, oh, that bitch. In the bottom <laughs> corner, was it like world champion choking small child? Small child. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it was that. Uh, but no, I think part of being like a smaller competitor and being like a smaller practitioner, um, I think is a good thing. And I mean, for those that can't tell, I mean, obviously, I know I looked really jacked on the video right now, but I'm only about 145 pounds. So Bryce, not, yeah, uh, Bryce does some some post post editing. Does he? Where he yeah, he made you gain 75 pounds. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I'm absolutely jacked. You know, I'm cycled off right now on steroids, <laughs> so eventually I'll pop back on. Uh, but I don't know. I like being a small guy. I think, you know, when I started jiu-jitsu, it was from the idea of it was – I'd always wanted to do martial arts. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, I loved watching Bruce Lee as a kid. I thought he was super cool, right? And he was a smaller dude. But I never really, and I don't know if it was the fear of, like, getting punched in the face, which we talked about earlier. Um, you know, no one wants to get punched in the face, especially when they're as pretty as I am. <laughs> you know, actually not that pretty. Um, but, you know, eventually I was like, you know, this would be kind of a cool thing to do it. And when I first started training, I was like, okay, I'm going to do this for life. Like, I'm going to make it a goal that I'm going to train for life. I don't care if I have breaks with work. I don't care if I take steps away for injuries. I'm going to come back. And I think being smaller, I've always kind of focused my jujitsu on, I want to do this forever. So even if it's the Baron Bolo or if it's Matrix, stuff that might like eventually like blow your knee out, like I'll do them, but I won't try to make that like, the crucial part of what I do so that I can at least continue to train, you know, through injury or, you know, as long as I can. But I do think being smaller, you get an advantage of having to be better at technique. You yeah. just have to, uh -huh. like, cause things, people will muscle a lot of things. And so you, you get smart about how to apply shoulder pressure or where to really know you're ahead on grips or other things. So, yeah, I mean, but I guess that's a cool statistic to be the smallest person on that's a male. Uh, yeah. you know? <laughs> the, you're like, you're the smallest male human being that's been on this show. It's maybe the smallest man ever. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have the world record for that, but you know, I think there's probably somebody out smaller than me. There, there could be. There could be. Do you have any other tips or advice for anybody who is especially starting out? Because you know how as a 140-pound person, when you first start jujitsu, and all the other white belts do have this strength to be able to use or this weight to be able to use anytime they do get in a bad spot. Do you have any advice for somebody that's starting out like that? Yeah. Um, I honestly think you get a lot of benefit from training with everybody. I know start, I, I would say starting out, though, it's a little harder because you're if you don't know anything, you're just going to feel like you're not progressing at all, mm -hmm. especially if you're all someone that's much stronger than you. But Jiu-jitsu is very attribute driven. I think a lot of people forget that. They're always like, oh, you know, leverage and technique above all. And it's like, I mean, leverage and technique, they're very important. But if somebody's faster than you 
or someone's timing's better or someone's stronger, they can beat you. Mm -hmm. And so you have to think about or utilize those attributes. And as a smaller person, like flexibility is probably something you're going to have. Like if you're a small person and you're not flexible, uh, that's terrible genetics for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> that really sucks. Uh -huh. uh, but usually you're going to have flexibility. Um, I would say the biggest tip I would give people is to focus on fundamentals and basics. Because I think a lot of jujitsu, I think it's better now, but it's always what's hot, right? Like I think there was that period of time where the Barambola was like, everyone was doing it. That mm -hmm. is the hottest technique. I'm going to do this from every position known to man. And then they wouldn't be able to escape side control. Yeah. No, or their cross collar choke was trash. Mm -hmm. And it's like, or they didn't understand how to distribute shoulder pressure in side control. You know, things that I think you have to be good at to actually get better. And so I would encourage anyone that's smaller to, you know, use your attributes. So if you like, you know, playing inverted guard or spider guard, you have long legs, totally great. But don't forget those fundamentals that you can get really good at because at the end of the day, those are going to be the things that are going to allow you to succeed against bigger people too. Mm -hmm. Like I think when I'm rolling with bigger guys or gals or whomever, like I'll focus more on playing top if I can, because I know if I play bottom, they're just going to try to smash me and maybe I take their back. Great. But otherwise I might just wind up being under like Sal, for instance, and his shoulder pressure Nobody for wants to be four minutes. Sal, man. And that's just going to suck. Now the difference with rolling with him is I'm probably not going to play top because <laughs> there's no way I'm taking this man down or sweeping him. Yeah. You know, you could just always not roll with him, you know? Yeah. But just, what's the fun in that? Right. Like he's, I mean, it's pretty fun. Yeah. You could be rolling with, somebody small and just beating them down so yeah i mean uh so that's one thing we're doing right now is we got a group uh phil has been orchestrating this 160 under thing which i know bryce didn't get the invite and was really upset about um i think coming in here that's one of the things he said mm -hmm. he was like hey uh i was really offended that i didn't get the invite that's sizest man yeah well you know? are you under 160 uh, yeah, i don't know that he, bryce is bryce is much bigger i mean yeah he is he's on steroids he acts like He's under 160, but I think he walks around about 175, 180. Yeah. He, he, his strength levels are under 160, but his actual <laughs> weight is <laughs> so. But so we got this group now uh, that are under 160 getting together, which I think will be good. Uh, but I think you should train with everybody, especially being smaller, because you're going to figure out very quickly, like how to hold side control better or how to be better at holding mount if you roll with guys that have strength, because they may just resort to using that and you're going to have to deal with it. So I, that'd be my best advice, fundamentals. And I know that sounds so lame, but I really do think fundamentals are key. What do you, because you named off some things, you said fundamentals, but you named off some things that I would say that most people don't reference as fundamentals, as in like keeping shoulder pressure, being able to keep side control. I always notice that that answer is given a lot, but most people don't seem to have a, a, a definition of what fundamentals are. Are there any other fundamentals, especially as a lighter guy that you say like, Hey, these are things you absolutely need. Maybe not even individual techniques, but you know, absolutely. Um, man, I think, I know you and I've talked about Henry Aikens a whole lot, right? Mm -hmm. I love that guy. I think he's got, I think he's probably the most slept on black belt. No doubt. And I'm, and that's a, I know that's a hard, hard take, probably a wild statement, but I think he's probably one of the most slept on black belts. And I say that because when you watch his content, and we talked about earlier, like there's a lot of trash on YouTube. Watch Henry, and if you haven't, if anyone's listening to this has never watched or doesn't know who Henry Aikens is, I would encourage you to go check him out. Check him out on the I Suck at Jiu Jitsu show yeah. first. Oh, was he on the podcast? Yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely. That's awesome. Um, he has, I think, some of the best fundamental understanding of Jiu Jitsu out there. And I think part of that is because he trained with Hickson, you know, directly for a, a long time. And I think that's the brilliance in why Hickson is Hickson. It's like why Hodger is Hodger. I think when I think of fundamentals, um, so shoulder pressure is one, and it's only because, and I like to show people this all the time, is like if you, if you lay someone on the ground and you just have them lay down, you're like, do a shrimp, right? And they do a shrimp. I'm like, okay. And then I push their face to the side and I hold that there and I'm like, do a shrimp. And they can't. Mm -hmm. And they're like, why can't I do a shrimp? And I'm like, well, it's your physiology of your body. I was like, by turning your head completely over, I've broken the spine being straight. And as soon as you start to mess with the spine's alignment, that's where all your power comes from, from your hips and from everything else. So it's things like that. So the other thing I would say is like arms on the inside. So if you're playing in the guard, right, fighting your arms to the inside. There's a video, I think, like one of the only videos of me on YouTube competing. Uh, there's like Tyler the whole time is like, fight your arms to the inside. You know, I'm a dumb blue belt. Mm -hmm. So at the time I'm like, yeah, Tyler, whatever. I know yeah. what's going on. And then you look back and you're like, 
Ah, yeah, that's brilliant. So like fighting your arms to the inside, whoever's controlling the inside space. Mm -hmm. The other big thing, and I think people that train with me or, you know, we do open mats, I always talk about is the elbow knee space. Mm -hmm. Like whoever's controlling the elbow knee space is ahead. And regardless of where you're at, whether it's side control, guard, mount, because whoever gets the elbow knee space back, if you're on the bottom, that's how you're going to get out, right? So like when I think fundamentals, it's things like that. Obviously having a good collar choke, like the guy that taught you, you know, yep, obviously that, the, you his, his instructional is coming out soon. Yeah. You know, look for it. I suck at BJJ podcast. Um, <laughs> learning like some of the basics, but body positioning too, like understanding why mount, like holding mount is good. I think you did an instructional not too long ago talking about chest pressure, right? Mm -hmm. And John Thomas, love, if you guys haven't seen John Thomas, that's another guy that like. Check him out on the I Suck at Jiu Jitsu show. Yep. Also on that, <laughs> that's another guy that slept on, I think. But I think that's because he went and decided to move to Europe. Mm -hmm. I forget where he's at. Is it Sweden? Sweden. Yeah. Uh -huh. Which. I think he did it because he was like, I'm tired of living in the U.S. I'm yeah. going to go live somewhere that's way cooler uh -huh. in the U.S. Um, but I think a lot of people sleep on him. He is, I think, a very cerebral practitioner. He's super smart. For those that don't know, he was high-level CIA, uh, probably killed like 30 people. <laughs> uh, no, I think he worked for the FBI, actually. I don't know if you knew that or not. Was it the FBI? I think it was the FBI. No, I'm almost 100% positive. Okay. I he knew was that he worked some analyst. federal. Yeah, I knew he was an analyst in some federal. Like We trained together a bunch then. Yeah. But I guess I never ask what, what I, I, I think who it was, he was working I think for. it was the FBI, and that's why he was in St. Louis. Because I think originally he's from the area too, right? Uh -huh. Is he from St. Louis? Yeah. But I, yeah, I'm pretty sure he was working for the FBI. That was actually a fun story. Um, when I used to travel a lot for work, uh, I stopped in, in Atlanta when, mm -hmm. when he was at uh, Allianz. Uh -huh. And that was before he got his black belt. He was still brown belt at the time. And this would have been like probably, what, 2013, I want to say? Probably. I don't remember when Maybe he got Maybe a his little black. before. It, yeah, I don't remember when he got his black but I had done a couple privates when he was back in the St. Louis area and realized, like, this guy's, like, his knowledge of jujitsu is, like, this is how I learned. It's very conceptual, mm -hmm. which for me, you know, I, I think you talked about this, too, in your podcast not too long ago. Like, conceptual jujitsu for me is how I learn. Yeah. I have to be big picture. And I think it's my stubbornness as a kid. If I don't understand why I need to do something, I don't want to do it. Yes. Like, if you just tell me you need to put your elbow here, I'm going to be like, no, screw you. I'm not putting my even if that is the right answer. I need to know why. Uh, and I went and trained with him um, as a brown belt down there. And I think um, we did like, he was teaching at some other school in Atlanta at the time. And I think he brought me in and he was like, hey, we'll just train. And I went and trained with him for an hour. And I think he literally beat the shit out of me um, for the entire hour. Oh, yeah. Like worse than any beating I'd ever had. Yeah, that's I think a he John passed, Thomas move for sure. Yeah, I think he passed my guard no less than 4,000 times Yeah, uh, with the same knee the slice. The same thing over and over. Yeah, he's like, hey, I'm just going to work this. Uh, but he's got a lot of really good, I think, conceptual jujitsu that has a lot of good fundamentals that mm -hmm. small guys can utilize. Because he's not very big, but he's tall. He's yeah. super long. Um, but so. he still, I mean, he competed at 50, 154. Yeah, 154. Most, yeah, most of his jujitsu. Yeah, and uh, the dude, again, another slept on guy. I mean, I think he has some of the best, like, YouTube content for mm -hmm. jujitsu. jitsu I that's totally agree. One of the few YouTube channels, I think you might have recommended the two two of the YouTube channels that I would recommend is, is Henry Ace and from John yours. Thomas. <laughs> yeah, aside from Josh McKinney, BJJ. Um, but I always recommend that. Yeah, and, of course. And so, yeah, that's a, man, that is a really interesting thing about you know, about John is just how good he got before people got good. Um, Cause like now there are, there's so many good instructors in the level of, even if you look at um, Jay and Kyle, who we've been under forever, um, they have gotten better as instructors uh, since we started. You know what I mean? Absolutely. It's not like they're teaching the same things that they taught in 2008. That would be really discouraging if they were. And you'd probably have to unlearn it today. Because how much of jujitsu did you learn early on that you don't do anymore at all? Because you're like, oh, there's a far better way to do this. Exactly. But some of what you learned, because that's how it was at the time, was, no, this is how Hoyler does it, or this is how Hodger does it, so you have to do it this way. And then not realizing that, well, just because they're super successful at doing it that way doesn't mean you can't do it another way and also make it work for you or make it work better. Because I do think jujitsu is, I think one of the things that is the beauty of it is it's very personal. There's certain concepts that you can teach people and then they might have a different way of doing it mm -hmm. because either their body type or their strength or just how they move. And they'll find a way to work it into where they do it a particular way and maybe it works really well for them, right? And I think that's kind of a cool thing about it is you can kind of make it your own. 
like there's certain things that are always going to like, and that's, I guess the fundamentals, right? You have to do this. Like, cause if you're not doing this, then you're not going to be able to do this. Right. There's some of those, but the majority of it though is very open. You can kind of make it whatever you want to make it. Yeah, man. That's like, that is back to John. That's what he did really well. I, I remember just like him coming in with these different ideas to training and being like, man, this might be the first time anyone's had this idea in jujitsu, and it, it at least explained it this way. Right. And so, yeah, seeing people like that is just is huge. Um, and to see them do well too, right? And like mm-hmm. your podcast is doing well. That's cool. It's cool to see jujitsu grow and kind of see where it's at now from where it was initially. I still think there's so much potential in the jujitsu community to put out, you know, really good content and to grow the sport more. And I think we're seeing it a lot now with Nogi mm-hmm. because a lot of people, you know, MMA and they watch that. And so Nogi looks more exciting. I also think Nogi is a little more exciting because it's more fast paced. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone hates on Gi Jiu Jitsu because they're like, oh, you're just going to grab a grip and, you know, slow people down. Well, for us, almost 40, yes, mm-hmm. that is what we want to do. Yeah. Uh, but also, I think there's intricacies in Gi Jiu Jitsu that if you really don't appreciate Jiu Jitsu for what it is, and I'm not trying to gatekeep. But I think there's a lot of really good jujitsu in the gi that you just don't see in no gi for those that primarily train no gi. But that being said, I think you have to train both because you can't just go from being a high level gi practitioner and destroy the no gi scene. Mm-hmm. You know, we finally saw, saw Tyne and Dalpra, which I was great to finally see him, you know, no gi. And I think he's going to do extremely well. But I'm guarantee he's had to ch- like change how he trains a little bit to do no gi because there's just certain things that he's not going to be able to do in no gi that he does extremely well at the highest. And I think probably pound for pound, he's probably the best in the world right now. I think Mikey Musumichi, and that's because I love small guys. <laughs> I think Mikey's probably pound for pound the best jujitsu athlete in the world. But um, I think Tynan is right there as well, no doubt. And if yeah, you see that if he continues that transition and is able to to win ADCC or something like that, uh, oh, t- and being I- Tynan, and you see how well Mikey has done in Nogi, and and just you look at that, I think that that is gonna that is gonna really show that like you know there is this people always want it to be one way, like oh well you can only do Nogi, you know you can only do Gi, you can only you have to do Gi, you have to do Nogi. Uh, and the truth is there are so many other, there are so many avenues, right? Mm-hmm. And we, to assume that we are enlightened right now and that like, oh no, we know that there's only this way to get great at Nogi because John Danaher says it, or because there's this way to get good at jujitsu because this guy says it. It's like, yeah, but he, he, did, he wasn't relevant three or four years ago. We didn't know that stuff, but we were sure that we were enlightened three or four years ago. Who's to say that 10 years from now, it's not going to be totally different. When you think about the scene that we came up in, you know, 15 years ago, it yeah. is not even close to what it is now. Now, dude, the level is so much higher. Like, you know, and I know guys like Bryce, they're still competing at the adult level. You know, um, it's tough. Like guys that are, I would even venture to say some white belts now at the adult level are training like pro athletes, right? Mm-hmm. It's so much different. Um, but I think that's kind of the beauty of jujitsu too, is its evolution, right? You know, it all started from, you know, old school Japanese, you know, techniques that were then modified a little bit to make it more applicable to smaller people. And, you know, from there, the MMA side of things and realizing like, oh, if I'm getting punched in the face, there's certain things I can do that can make that a lot easier. So I'm not getting hit in the face. Um, And I think you'll continue to see more of an evolution of it. Um, But I think you're absolutely right. I think jujitsu, it goes back to you being galvanizing, right? (laughs) Jujitsu is a, the community as a whole is always, it's us versus them. I think that's kind of always been the old school mentality because you have the whole creanche, you know, Mm -hmm. and, you know, my team is this, I'm not going to teach any techniques to this other team, you know, because screw them, we compete against them. And I think what's really helped jujitsu is people have, realized or have grown up to say hey that's a really dumb perspective to have like if you want jujitsu to get really good or if you want to get good at jujitsu you need to train with as many different people as you can which is i think what you were doing with open mats back in the day right like Mm -hmm. and i don't want to say it was faux pas at that time but it was still not like it kind of was yeah it's not like it is today like today like you know we still have the sunday trainings and i you know come in and there's people that come in from all over 
that's what makes jujitsu great is you need the community to bring in all these different techniques and theories and thought process because everyone learns different. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what helps it evolve to get better. And that's why I think it is like better now than it was 15 years ago is because people are actually embracing being open about cross training, being open about there's a million ways to do things. It's not just these three ways to do it. And I think that's just, it's a good thing overall. Man, I, I totally agree. So I know that you and I could go on for hours talking about jujitsu. We always do. Um, but we're getting to the end. Bryce is asleep over there. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sure, sure the camera has him to sleep. Yeah, I'm sure the camera hasn't switched in, in the last like 30 minutes. Um, but I do want to finish with something. I, I tend to finish with this question. Um, and I assume you'll have a good perspective on it. So um, when you look back, um, when I ask you what is the best or some of the best jujitsu advice that you have ever gotten, um, what kind of pops into your head? Wow. Um, I think, and it's going to sound so simple, right? Um, you hear it at every promotion, right? Someone gets their black belt and then they're like, oh, this is just the beginning. I think the best perspective to look at jiu-jitsu is it is a journey and when they say that what they're saying is you should look at jiu-jitsu as something you want to do for the rest of your life now you don't have to right mm -hmm. but i think you should look at it that way and if you look at jiu-jitsu as like this is going to be something i'm going to continue to do for the rest of my life you can then not put so much pressure on yourself to want to get really good at this or to win all these competitions or i'm going to tap all these people in the room you know so that i feel cool about myself i think if you Take the perspective that jujitsu is going to be something that is just going to be a part of who you are and what you do. You know, um, I think that will be some of the best advice I give to anybody is just embrace the idea of it's not this linear thing that you're just going to go from point A to point B on, right? Mm -hmm. You might take all these different side roads, you know, which is kind of like me. You know, I haven't just trained consistently the whole time I've been training. I've had things that come up in life, you know, work or covid you know i didn't get to train that was probably the worst in train for like almost two years mm -hmm. you know my wife's got an autoimmune condition so we were really worried about you know if i got sick she could get really sick and so having to give that up was was awful like mm -hmm. my mental state was not great that and so that was was good about it was that really made me understand what jiu-jitsu means to me and i think everyone can kind of they all have their different origin story of what they get why they get into jiu-jitsu and why they do it but I think what you need to do is figure out why you do jujitsu, what you love about it, and then think, I want to do this because of that reason for the rest of my life, and then focus on it that way. And I think your outlook will be a lot more positive, too. That way you're not just beating yourself up, you know, after every gym training session where McKinney passes your guard 35 times. What you a know, jerk. What a jerk. Uh, which always happens, I think, to everyone. I think everyone leaves a training session at some point where they're just driving home, and they're like, man, why did I put my leg there? Mm -hmm. Like, why did I let him have that grip? But I think just that, I, th I would say. Um, and then the other thing is fundamentals, right? And I'm going to be that old school guy to say it, but I really do think that if you can get really good at fundamentals or understanding why the moves are working, why the positions are dominant, it'll help you overall whenever you're breaking down the, fi the finer details that, you know, when you're on the mat, on open mats, that's where you get good at the details. I think you, you have to approach jujitsu from the concepts, me personally, and the details are going to come. Mm -hmm. If you just focus on the details and not the why, I don't think you'll, it'll take hard, a longer time, I think, for it to stick. I completely agree. It's way harder to remember the details, right? I, yeah. I mean, how many times you train and you're like, oh, I forgot I could do that. Like, <laughs> I forgot that that was a part of that sequence, you know, and you're like, oh, I just found that again. Yeah, man, I, I completely agree. I think that that's something that we've both, you know, always, always talked about is kind of the why of, of why things work in jujitsu because it does take when you know why something works, you can then change up what the what, right? You can say, okay, well, if it works because of elbow knee space, well, this is another way to occupy elbow knee space, and this is another way to do it. If it works because of inside fight, this is another way to win an inside fight. Right. And then it makes it so much easier to explain what is actually happening in jiu-jitsu. I think a lot of people just want the easy answer, right? Mm -hmm. And so maybe that's the other advice is jiu-jitsu, you're not going to get good at overnight. Some people are really good. You know, there's people I think that take to it a lot faster uh, for a host of reasons. For me, uh, not not the not the smartest grappling IQ, I guess, out there. Or I just, you know, didn't take to it as fast as some others. But I think as long as you're patient with yourself, 
and you know just be honest with yourself if you're not doing something well ask questions you know get it don't just go into it and try to kid yourself on whether you're doing something well or not because eventually the mat will tell you whether you are or not because the mat never lies man that's the humility in it and it's it's humbling i think that's one of the things i love most about it is if you ever feel like you're really good at jujitsu uh, go train and go find someone you haven't trained with and let them beat the shit out of you. And then you're going to leave thinking, well, okay, I'm not that good at all. I suck at jujitsu. I hear you. Anything you want to say to finish? No. All right. Thanks for having me on. I mean, this was fun. You know, I, podcasts are great. I think these are kind of cool things to get in and just talk. And also for anyone out there, cause they're probably like, I have no idea who this guy is. Why would Josh want him on his podcast? And so, <laughs> man, hopefully I- you guys enjoyed it. I, uh, yeah, I'm glad that you came on. I knew we would have a fun conversation and I, I really enjoyed it. I always know if I enjoy the conversation, at least somebody else will. Yeah. We'll see uh, how many views we get, but obviously this uh, photo is coming back with me. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That'll, that'll definitely be framed right over your bed. I'm sure. Oh yeah. My, I don't know. I don't know where my wife will put it. We'll put it somewhere. And that is the episode. Thank you guys for checking this one out. Uh, Like I said, I really loved filming this one. This was so funny. Uh, Just did not expect Josh to come in with the the photo to autograph. And then the fact that we kept it there uh, the entire interview, I thought was a pretty great prop. Nobody ever brings props for the show. Uh, That's a a lesson to any future I Suck at Jiu-Jitsu show guest. You bring a prop and... Well, whatever you want up there, and we will we will use it. I guess I guess last week uh, Robert Arias did bring some Arias Bros Jiu-Jitsu koozies, and then was just laying them around the studio. But you only got to see one of those koozies, and so. Uh, but that's all we have for you guys today. Hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. As always, if you did enjoy it, the best way to let us know that is to share it, is to throw it on your Instagram story. Um, maybe even you can send me, you can send Josh a message and just say, you know, thank you for that episode. Uh, I really think he he delivered some great information and it's definitely stuff that's going to be helpful for a lot of people. And so that is all I have for you guys today. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I hope you guys check out our YouTube channel if you have not yet. That is Josh McKinney BJJ. And most importantly, I hope today's episode helps you guys suck just a little bit less at jujitsu. Have a great day, guys.